So this, uh, the green rare is basic conjuration. With the top six cards of your library, put a creature into your hand. Hmm. I don't know how I feel about this one. It's, I think it's again, one you don't take very highly. It's, it's a pretty good card to have. It's like draw a good card for three. Um, definitely worth having in your board, but I wouldn't prioritize this. But it's probably better than most of the common lessons, if I had to guess. And draw a good card, gain three life. You shouldn't whiff on this, right? A creature of six seems pretty likely. This one I don't think is going to be very good. Yeah, this one, this one is like a 14th, 15th pick. Again, you just, it's like the white one, you just don't play this card. Or don't take this card, I mean. You'll put it in your sideboard if it ends up in your pile, but you take like anything playable over it. Any other lesson over it, I would think. I didn't look how many Planeswalkers there are, but there aren't very many. So this is an uncommon green one. So this is Disenchant, and if it's two or less CMC, you get a pest. So I made a little uh, I made a little reminder down here for the names of the guilds and the tokens that each guild is associated with. So there are several cards that make these tokens in each guild. So this one, for example, is a Witherbloom token, the pest. So this card seems okay. Um, we, we will see how many artifacts or enchantments there are in the set and how relevant they are or how highly you want to pick this. But I wouldn't say that this is a, hey, strategist, how you doing? But I wouldn't say that this is a, a card you would prioritize in the draft portion. We're starting out with just the uh, lessons strategist. So in regards to the tokens I just mentioned, this is the Prismari common lesson that makes the Prismari token. Mm, I don't think I can, but I appreciate the offer. Where are you cube drafting? So this one, this one is the 4-4, so the Prismari token. This one seems very powerful. I really like the idea of playing a learn card and just getting a free 5 or a free 4-4 four, four for 5. Like that's just a lot of value. It's uh, pretty easy to cast. Old edition vintage cube, nice. So yeah, I think this one's going to be one of the better of the common lessons. Um, we can look at the other versions of this, the other colleges. So the, the blue-green one is Fractal Summoning. I do not want to save that image. So the, the Quandrix token is a 0-0 zero, zero Fractal. There are many different ways to create the counters for it. This particular card is X. This one's okay. I don't like this one as as well as the uh, the ones that just have the fixed size. Because this doesn't scale well at any cost, right? Like 3 for a 1-1, one, one, 4 for a 2-2, two, two, etc. None of those options are very good. Unless you're heavily into ramp and you know it's always going to be top end. So, for example, I like the blue-red one much more than the blue-green one. But we will see. Maybe I'll be surprised. I like the black-white one quite a bit. I like... Because it, it has flying, of course. So this is almost Windrake. Windrake is the 2-2 two, two for 3. And this casting cost is pretty easy to hit if you're in all if you're in both colors, of course. It's just basically three colorless. But it has a very versatile casting cost. You play it in black or white or both. But I like this one. I like this one better than the blue-green one. I don't know if I like it as much as the blue-red one. But it's close. The black-green one makes two, unlike the others. And the Witherbloom token is a 1-1 one, one that gains a life when it dies, so you get two of those pests. And look how adorable these pests are. They look like maybe they're a little stinky, but... You think white commons and uncommons seem a little weak? I will keep that in mind when we get to white commons. I have a whole bunch of tabs open up here at the top, but we're starting with just the lessons. Just I want to get a feel for this mechanic and see how powerful learning is. So we're going to look at the 20 lessons to start. Um, so the last of the make a token for my tribe or my college is spirit summoning. And this one just makes a 
I don't know if I like this one as much as Inkling. I don't know. This there are synergies with this with the um, creature type spirit I noticed in Lorehold, whereas the other ones maybe don't have the specifically like tribe synergy. Like for example, the pest token has synergies with the what the cards are doing in black and green, but I was just trying to point out that this one specifically has cards that pump spirits in this in this college. Is it what's the name? Is it college school? What do I call these guilds? Anyway, so back to the other ones. Here are some colorless ones. This one, I'm a little I'm a little confused as to whether you're gonna want this one in your main deck or your sideboard. I don't know how common it is going to be to play three colors or four colors in this. But I do like this one. I think that... Hmm. Like if I had three of this, would I put one in the main and two in the sideboard? I think it again depends on what the deck is trying to do. It's just you kind of want this card on, on turn two, don't you? And there's not really a way to do that with learn. Or very many ways to do that. Usually you're going to be getting your learn in on turn two, three, or four. I think, or maybe even later, like some of them are combat tricks. So you have to wait until you can set up a combat where you're going to want to play your trick. So I'm not really sure how to evaluate this one. I do, I do know that I like it though. Hmm. I will be taking this card somewhere. Maybe we'll come back to that one. Yeah, for a late splash bomb, exactly. And that in that situation, you'd want it in the sideboard, right? But say you were playing like a focused red-white deck and you had a bunch of casting costs that were heavily color required, you might want to run one of those in your main, right? That was kind of what I was getting at. Like it seems like you could do either for that one, whereas a lot of these lessons you probably just want in the board. Um, yeah, like like this one, I don't, I don't really see main decking this card. This just doesn't seem good enough to main deck. Maybe if it split up the counters, you it might be good enough, but... This one seems to me like something you just leave in the sideboard no matter what. But I do like it as a just, you know, free card off of your learn. So this is the red rare learn card. Discard any number of cards and draw that many cards. Then if you have seven or more cards in your graveyard, create a create a spirit. Hmm. Seems like good value, but nothing you would prioritize. Like, I don't think that I would take this and put myself into red just because I have a really good card in my board, even if this is a pretty powerful effect for off of a free card. This could really, really be great in the end game if you were flooded. You have three or four basics in your hand, you top deck your learn card, you play your learn card, you go get this. Get to draw a new hand and make a creature. Seems pretty good. Another colorless one. Five for exile target non-land permanent and its controller draws a card. So you're almost never gonna wanna use this on your own just to draw a card. Five to draw a card is just very unlikely to be what you're gonna wanna do. But how bad is it to exile their thing for them? Or how bad is it for them to draw a card if you're trying to exile something? Hmm, that's something you want to be doing very often. The thing better be good. But yeah, this seems like a really great out, kind of like the Raven form you don't want to play, but it's good to have for when you need it. Um, I could see main decking this if you're if you just like straight up didn't have removal, but I, I don't see myself main decking this very often. I still don't really know where in the draft you're going to be trying to pick up lessons. It's going to be very like metagamey, seeing what other people do. Yeah, I don't know what to call them either. Colleges, schools, etc. I might just keep calling them guilds. Yeah, all the lessons are sorcery speed, if you haven't noticed that so far. They're like literally all sorceries, because lesson is a, a subtype of sorcery, kind of like arcane. So, as they are designed now, lessons can only be sorceries. This one... Scry to draw a card. Would I want to main deck this card? Oh, one thing to point out is Magecraft. So I searched for how many cards in the set have Magecraft. There are 24. I think only six of them are common. There's one for each school and one white at common. 
So, and there are several uncommons. It looks like one for each school, an artifact. So if, if you're trying to build with, with Magecraft and you don't have the learn mechanic, very much of the learn mechanic in your deck, I could see, I could see wanting to maybe main board a, a, you know, a lesson like this. I could see that being a possible. But this is a pretty good fact, effect. Yeah, you saw Magecraft. Three mana preordain, I know, right? But it's a preordain that you can get off of the effect of another card. So it's still pretty hard to wrap your head around wrap my head around the uh the value on these. So here's the the only mythic lesson. This card's obviously very powerful. So this one you would this one you would main deck if you don't have very much learn, I think. Like say you only had one learn card, maybe you would just main this one instead and use learn to go get your other lessons and just try to draw this one. And if you had zero learn cards, you would just main this, right? It's just so powerful. Maybe maybe you maybe you're a low curve deck that doesn't want to get to 7, so you just don't play it in that scenario, but this is a very powerful card, right? Like even if it didn't have the word lesson on it, you'd still play this card in decks that could get to 7, I mean. I think. I don't know. It seems pretty good to me. So I think I would take this one pretty highly and then just try to have a bunch of learn. Like this seems like an incredible payoff for learn to me. It's cute value? I don't know. I think I think it seems pretty powerful, this one. Unless you're just referring to uh, learn and lesson in general. Um, this one doesn't seem very good to me. I saw this one earlier. Let's see here. So blue one, until end of turn, target non-land permanent loses all abilities. So this doesn't have to be a creature, it can be any non-land permanent. So you could attack them with your enchantment or whatever. You could... So wait, equip... Do auras that become creatures fall off? I can't remember. Does this make an aura fall off? Like a bounding gold or something? Like if you use this on a pacifism, does it fall off of your creature? I know equipment falls off if it's a creature, so I, I think auras do too. Yeah, okay, so this could make... That's kind of like a niche value scenario where this could be useful. Making a pacifism fall off. So what happens to their pacifism when it turns from a 1-1 one -one back into a pacifism or back into an aura? Just doesn't have anything... It's not equipped in or attached to anything, so it just goes to the yard? That's kind of how I assume that would happen. Wait, really? I don't... I mean, I don't know, that's... I have no idea actually, someone should someone should look into that or I will later. Um, otherwise I don't really care for this card. I don't really see it being very useful to turn your creature into slightly larger or their creature into slightly smaller at sorcery speed. It just doesn't seem useful enough. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah, it for sure comes off when you cast it, right? And then what happens afterwards? I assume it would just go to the yard. But regardless, I don't I don't think this card is very good. But again, the lessons, you just pick them up 12th, 13th, or 14th pick, and you just have them in your board for those niche scenarios, right? Hey Merlin, how's it going? We're doing a little set review here. Haven't seen you in a while, miss you. How you doing? Um, so the, here's the mono black one at Uncommon. Necrotic Fumes. The black black one. Exile a creature you control as a cost, and then exile a creature or a planeswalker. Yeah, this card seems great, especially in Witherbloom. Um, Witherbloom has the pests as pretty expendable creatures laying around. Niche good with fractals. Oh yeah, good point. I didn't think about that. I forgot about that. So this one, as Merlin just pointed out, so if you targeted your, your fractal that was, say, a 3-3 with this part, it would be a 7-7 seven, seven until end of turn, so... That is worth noting, especially if said fractal had trample or something. Creature can never be attached to anything. It will fall off, then the game will see an aura that isn't attached to anything and it will put into the graveyard before anyone gets priority. Oh wow, so it doesn't even get to be like a 4-4 four -four for the whole turn, it just dies. So if you if you target pacifism with this, the pacifism just goes to the yard immediately? Huh, that's not very intuitive, is it? Seems like they would get the at least get the creature until end of turn. Huh. 
Yeah, it says it loses all abilities. It doesn't say... Like, it's still an aura, right? It doesn't lose its types. It's a creature, right? Becomes... So when something says becomes a creature, does that mean it ceases to be the other things? Oh yeah, because it would say in addition to its other types, right? So maybe in that scenario, they do get the creature because it ceases to be an aura. Right? If it just becomes the creature. I don't know. We'll put that one on the back burner in terms of rules. Let's look at the mono white lesson. White white one, exile target non-land permanent, and they get a spirit. So this one, you might want to bash with one of your permanents, but getting just a 3-2, I don't know if it's worth... That's a pretty niche scenario. This kind of seems like a really bad raven form to me. But I suppose, I suppose it's still a raven form that you can get out of your board, so it's still something you want. Yeah, it's like Beast Within for sure. Beast Within being instant was pretty huge, but... Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll take a Beast Within in my sideboard that I can grab with a few cards. Speaking of being able to grab, there are 21 learn cards. Okay, so the mono red card. This one, kind of questionable, but again, it's a, it's a free card that can destroy an artifact or an X1. Or deal the last point of damage to your opponent when they're on one. So I mean, sure, I want this in my board if I have access to red mana and learn cards. Absolutely. Um, we can see how many good artifacts there are, see how relevant that is. I know there's a few good equipment. Enchant is a static ability written enchant object or player. Enchant ability restricts what an aura spell can target in order to attach to the garbage or plays not to Okay. Okay. This is the only part I'm talking about, the only part I'm confused about. Yes, Lyle, all the lessons are sorcery. Strategist is that I think that Mercurial Transformation makes it cease to be an aura until end of turn because it doesn't say becomes in addition to its other types. It just says becomes a blue frog 1-1. One, one. But I could be wrong on that point. Yeah, so the start from scratch does kill the it kills the uh, Orzov token and the Witherbloom token. Not that you necessarily want to use this on a pest. Let's look at the mono blue rare one. <clears throat> yeah, I think exactly what you just said, strategist. I think it would be it would be a creature until the end of turn, and then it turns back into an aura with nothing to be on and dies. Okay, so teaching of the archaics, blue two sorcery. An opponent has more cards. You draw two and you draw three if they have at least four more cards than you. So notably, this does nothing if you have the same amount of cards or less cards than, fewer cards than them. But sure, I mean, it seems like a, a reasonable thing to have access to. I like maybe playing this in the main if I'm aggro, So, but I don't know if there's a blue aggro deck. But even then, that's kind of risky. Could be the mirror match, you could draw it in the end game when you both have no cards or yeah because even i mean I, like it's going to be divination most of the time or nothing right this this part is unlikely so maybe this card is just bad you never main deck this card how highly do you prioritize this to have it in your board mm. seems like some of the common ones are better than this but i mean i would still take it if someone was giving it away Let's look at the learn cards. See how likely it is to get these lessons in our sideboard here. So there are one of each rare, one of each color rare. We can look at those first. So the blue rare. Blue rare looks pretty good. It's a 3-2 flyer that has the uh, skulking ghost ability. Just for spells, not abilities. Yeah. I mean, I guess you use the rummage ability when you didn't get the lessons, right? When everyone else got all the good lessons. So I think this card's great. I mean, I would you would just always play this if you're blue, right? Because even if you don't have a lesson, you get rummage. Most things that target a 3-2 that are spells would, would kill it, right? 
So this isn't a, a super huge drawback. The ones that say or ability are, are generally much worse. Yeah, evasion, three power, three mana. You could splash it if you want. I mean, you probably wouldn't splash this, but I mean, like, the casting cost is very reasonable. Yeah, I'm a fan of this card for sure. And just, I don't know, it, it, it just basically replaces itself, right? When it dies. Creeping Tarpit. Yeah, Creeping Tarpit rules. Yeah, I think it's very strong as well, Merlin. So let's see the other rares, the green rare. Okay, this is also very good. So this one, you don't have to wait for it to die, you just get it immediately. And it has, it passes the vanilla test as well. It's four for a five, four trample. This card is very solid. There's not really much else to say about this. It's just very strong. Nothing, nothing broken, but just a good value card for sure. We'll see like how bad four toughness is, I suppose, but my gut's saying this is just a, a high pick. Not a bomb, but a very high pick. The black one is an equipment, and I think is also very good. I, I think this card is also very strong. If you've been playing Kaldheim Limited, you know how good equipment with like an abil a random ability on it is. With all the runes. So this card's going to help you win races. It's going to pull you ahead if you're behind. This card's just great. Even if it didn't have, even if it didn't have learn, this card would be good. I mean, you, you're kind of a little bummed about, you know, like having to pay black over and over and over. Like maybe if you're playing in a two or three color deck, like it might be difficult to play this suit, move it around a lot because of the equip costs. Like it makes this very difficult to splash. Like being able to play this in the same turn and suit it is very unlikely if you're splashing this, right? So those are drawbacks that are, you know, relevant. <laughs> this pen is mightier than most swords. <laughs> <coughs> I don't know, most swords are pretty good in magic. But yes, I, I'm a fan of this card. This seems like a first pick to me. They're probably, probably uncommons better than this. But certainly not very many commons are better than this card. The white or the red monocolor is a phoenix. So as per usual, flying haste. It's kind of small, just a 2-2 for four. That's not very good on the vanilla test. So you get learn if you cast it if you cast it from anywhere, it doesn't have to be from your hand, but you don't get it when it comes back into play. So you can't learn loop over and over and over. But it does let you come back off of future learn instead of any other mode of learn. Interesting. I mean it it, it seems fine. Doesn't seem like anything broken. If you could I mean maybe there's a deck that's just a whole bunch of learn. And you also get the lessons in your... I mean, I guess you wouldn't really want to be... You know, you wouldn't, you're not getting lessons if this is your card, but... So that you're building around. You do both. I'm just saying that, like, you're not as heavily prioritized about needing to grab the lesson all the time if you're trying to get this guy back. But yeah, I don't know. I don't think this is anything insane. I think it's, like, just fine. Right. Seems like there might be a standard, a standard learn thing, maybe. We'll see about that. I generally, the generally cards that are built around the inset mechanic kind of tend to be a little weak in outer applications because there just aren't enough things that trigger it. Like Adventure, for example, like Lucky Clover isn't going to be a modern deck probably, but it was a really good standard deck, right? Um, so white, the mono white rare, Sparring Regimen. White two for an enchantment. You get learn when it comes in, and wow, that's a pretty good, a pretty good trigger. So you're only gonna get one trigger for each attack. You don't get per creature, but you also get to untap the creature. Okay, so it's kind of like plus one plus one vigilance on an attacker every single turn that you're attacking. So this card seems incredible, right? Just very, very good. Um. So remember, there are uh, five common learn cards that make creatures. So this can even go get a creature, right? Kind of. Just start pumping, I mean. So it's not even like a bad top deck when you're when you're all out of gas if you have the appropriate lesson in your sideboard. So yeah, this card seems great. I guess it does nothing on a you know on an empty board, but still. Besides the learn part, I like I like this card. 
So the non-rare ones, we have Academic Dispute. This one's interesting as a very cheap way to just learn. I don't remember what Arclight is. Yeah, Sparring Regimen's great. Um, so this card, you can either force them to block. You could also give your own creature reach. I mean, it would force it to block as well, but that might not be... You, if you're giving it reach, you want it to block, right? <clears throat> so, in the past, there are a lot of cards that say target creature blocks this turn if able. However, they don't usually have this clause, which means that if you're targeting something that you want to block your flyer, it often just doesn't work, whereas this kind of fixes that situation, which is interesting. So, if you want their 1-1 one, one ground creature to die to your 2-2 two, two flyer, this, this does the job. Oh, I see. Arclight Phoenix. Yes, my bad. I just saw Arclight as two words and thought that was the name of a card. Um, this card is it seems pretty good if you're trying to learn. So give you some good lessons. But it's not really worth the card itself, right? So the lesson you have to be getting... It seems, it seems hard to get enough value off of this part. But I suppose if you have good attackers and they have weak blockers, you might get a heck of a lot of value off this card, him. Huh? But it, it seems like a very situational, not wanting this in very many type of decks kind of card. I could be wrong on that, though. It is probably the most efficient way to learn. I guess you do technically have to have a creature in play. Yeah, it's kind of like a cantrip, for sure. But it's like a... It just seems like the, the effect it actually does to get value off that might be a little tricky. This one, similar. This one might be a little bit better than the, the previous one. I really wish this one cost one. Like, if this one cost one, it would be legitimately good, right? I'm just imagining going to get one of the creature, one of the creature lessons, so you're paying two to kind of fog a little bit and then go get a creature or a draw card thing. Yeah. I'm not sure wh wh which Investigate card is. I, I understand like the Investigate mechanic. It does feel a lot like Investigate. Learn does to me. Feels like a clue, but instead of popping to draw a card, you're popping to pick a card from your sideboard. I watched a few set reviews over the weekend and nobody seemed to like this card very much, but it seems to me like th this kind of card could be very good if you're on the Magecraft plan. There are also, I think, some life gain synergies in Witherbloom, but this isn't a very high take, but this does seem like um, it could be very synergistic filler for some decks. But again, depends on how good your lessons are. Jace's Scrutiny. Okay. Yeah, it's exactly the same as exactly the same card. Yeah. It's like they just have this... Uh, the shell that they're ready to put the new arc, you know, the new mechanic on. And blue has the minus four card. Divide by zero. Turn target spell or permanent with mana value one or greater to its owner's hand. So this is remand, but you don't get a draw card. And it can also hit permanence. So not, not lands or zeros. I don't think there are zeros in this set. So it's basically just not land. Oh, also the tokens. So this notably does not kill the creature tokens. So that's very relevant that it is, it's not just land. <laughs> and then, yeah, I mean, this start card seems incredible to me. It's gonna be a tempo play and it replaces itself. Yeah. Well, different than investigate in terms of the way it plays out, but like almost identical in investigate in terms of the way the mechanic works, right? You're replacing it with a card. I mean, I guess not. Rummage isn't replacing it with a card, but sure. It's different than Investigate, but similar. <laughs> okay, here is another common. Enthusiastic Study. Hit him with a big book. So we have a combat trick, plus three, plus one, and Trample. This card seems fine. Three is kind of a lot for this effect, but it does get Trample as well. 
But you have run amok at two for plus three plus three trample that has to be an attacker. Do we want to use this on a blocker? Maybe. There are cards that are like two fours at five in, in red, I know. That makes them a five five. This card seems fine. I will certainly play this card at some point. We have a bat with a huge eye. Yeah, Brute see, see, there you go, Mercurio Blue with the uh, references of them just taking a shell and putting in the new mechanic, right? So the new mechanic they put in for this one is just they paid a colorless to add to a vanilla card and put the new mechanic on it for Brute Strength. So I Twitch. 1-1 one, one flying 1-1, one, one, and when it dies, learn. I think I like this. Seems like a pretty good one turn one play. It gets in for three or four damage, eventually chump blocks and replaces itself. Seems great. Stops X1s. Trades. Like, do you want to trade your 2-1 for this? I don't. I mean, I guess it depends on whether or not your 2-1 learned. Okay, we have some ramp, it looks like. Field trip. Search for a forest, put it on the battlefield, tapped. Okay. Oh, by the way, it no longer says shuffle your library, you just shuffle. Hmm. I think I like this. It's not it's not amazing, but there are a lot of blue green X spells, I think, and expensive things. There are also a lot of expensive Prismari spells. But I guess I mean teamer could be a three color thing you do, right? Green, blue, and red blue. So surely this will end up in a teamer home or teamer deck, right? Because just because of the big spells. Or a uh or a Simic deck. It's unfortunate it doesn't get any basic. Yeah, it does It does kind of seem like learn costs one mana value, Lyle, I agree. You like shuffling your hand? I was just thinking about that, like, when it tells you to put cards on the bottom of your library, it doesn't say shuffle them, it just says put them in a random order. So it's just like, search your library for a basic forest card, put that card on the battlefield tapped, then put your library in a random order, <laughs> is what it should say. So, first day of class. Red one instant. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, put a 1-1 one -one counter on it, gains haste. Learn. So this one, do you want to be paying two more to cast your creature? Not very often. But I do like that you can cast this without any target. So this one can kind of just function as red one instant grab a lesson that every once in a while in the end game does its other effect or the mid game maybe on a cheap creature i suppose like a cheap flyer could be pretty good with this this also could be really nuts if you could somehow get a bunch of tokens to come into play yeah for sure i hate spending mana to give haste as well it's okay if you like Put a rune of speed on your equipment that costs one to equip because then every creature you draw is just like pay one but that's not like a whole card every time right like this one yeah i'm not huge on the top effect here but i am willing to give a chance learn the chance that maybe it is good enough to just play this card to go get a lesson if you have several lessons it's certainly possible right view image this one Kind of wish this was an instant, but maybe it'd be too good. I don't know. Doesn't seem like it'd be too good. But I think I like this one better than the red one that is target creature has to block gain reach. I think I like this one better than that one. I don't know. I think there are plus one plus one counter, G counter synergies in black white, but not maybe in white red. So maybe you can max this card out if you're playing silver quill. Hunt for specimens. Black one. Create a pest. Learn. So this one is very similar to me to the gain for life. Learn. Maybe slightly better in some decks. Like a 1-1. One, one, a pest is probably better than for life most of the time. So if you if you need the, the body, this one's better. If you need the life gain trigger, maybe the other one's better. I don't know. The other one is easier to cast because it was hybrid black green. So I guess maybe... That is worth noting. 
So this card, I think, is maybe just the best learn card or one of. So just three damage to anything, learn. It does a sorcery, unfortunately, but this card just seems bonkers. Like, I think this is definitely a first pick in some packs. Can even go face. This card is just great. Not much more to say about this one. Which one's Guiding Voice? Guiding Voice is the white one. I think I think we play Guiding Voice most of the time, yeah. I think you just play it. I mean, this is all, of course, like, do you have the lessons, right? Like, do you have the cards to go get? Because, like, I don't know if I like this card if it's always Rummage, right? I don't think I play... Put a West plus one counter on a creature, Rummage. I don't think I put that, like, all the time in every white deck, right? Maybe. Maybe I'd play one in a lot of white decks. It's a good way to fix your flood later. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, the where we take lessons is going to be really hard to figure out. It's going to be a very like metagame thing, seeing how other players take them and how high we have to take them. Because you you don't want to take them high, right? Like they're not even going in your main. But you do want to have access to them if you have the learn cards, so. This one is a two mana wall, 04, tap to gain a life, or you do not have to, um, you don't have to tap it to sack it for learn, so you can gain a life the turn you sack it as well. Assuming it's not sick. This one seems okay. You probably don't always main this. This kind of feels like a BO3 card to board in against aggro, but if you have the life gain synergies, certainly you'd be playing this card, right? I don't know, I, I don't know if I know all the life gain synergies yet, I just know that they exist in some to some degree. So maybe this is an enabler for that. But this card seems pretty solid, like pretty easy to get get its value out of two mana in a card, I think, here. Yeah, it does seem like a nightmare for aggro. Just like if if your if your deck has defensive creatures that can also attack, like maybe you don't need it for game one. You know what I'm trying to say though. Like maybe it's kind of more of a board card, but it does seem like a very efficient anti-aggro card. Like very efficient. Might even be good enough for constructed. I don't know what constructed aggro looks like these days. Oops. Man, I don't want to save it. Pop quiz. This one's an instant for three. Draw a card. Learn. Okay, so this is very similar to divination, right? Instead of two cards, you get. One card and learn. It's very it's very curious to me which of these effects is better. I guess it depends on your sideboard. Like, this one could be a land. This one is like always a spell, right? And you do get to do them in order, right? So you can draw the card. And say you draw a basic you don't want. You could choose to rummage it instead of choosing to go get your you know, subpar, mediocre lesson, maybe, say you don't have a really good one. That's worth pointing out, I think, right? If it was the other way around, it'd be much worse. Because you also might figure out which lesson you need after you see the card you draw. Like, if you draw your removal spell, you go get your something else instead, or whatever. Yeah, so I think this card's good. You probably don't want very many of this. It's kind of clunky. But I do like this card. We know drawing is better than rummage. We do know that. But once you draw the card, if the draw is a whiff, maybe you choose to instead not instead of replacing you know the second mode is a new card. Maybe you just fix the first card. Who knows? Um, I think this card coming up. Yeah, this card I think is also very good. I think this is similar in power level to the red one, right? The red one's the removal spell. Like this one's maybe not quite as good, but. This is just an incredible value to me. So I guess at worst it's Goblin or it's the new uh the Goblin Piker that's in Kaldheim, the red one. There's a 2-1 Berserker that's just when it comes in rummage. So this one is just better than that. And I like that card, so this card seems great to me. Very good. Yeah, Immersturm. No, Immersturm Raider. Yeah, Immersturm Raider is the card. Close. Yeah, you got there. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Appreciate you. But yeah, I think this card's great, right? Like, I don't know, tell me I'm wrong. I think this card's very good. 
Um, although maybe red, although maybe like red white doesn't look as aggressive as it normally is. I think black white looks pretty aggressive. Okay, so then we have another. This is a common. Exile a creature for white or black, white or black four. Man, that art, art's so sick. And then exile an instant or sorcery card from a graveyard. So there is a lore hold mechanic that is whenever a card is removed from your graveyard, do X, Y, or Z. So this could trigger that. So if you want to hit your own thing. I don't know the relevancy of getting rid of their instants and sorceries in their yard. But I suppose there's got to be something that can help them or hurt this hurts them somehow. And then learn, of course. Um, you cannot, someone, I saw someone over the weekend mention that you could exile your own sorcery lesson from your yard and then learn it, but you can't do that because outside the game means specifically your sideboard. Cards in exile do not count as outside the game, even though intuitively you would assume they might. So Papa Taco says they're buyback cards from the yard in red, blue, okay. Six is a lot for removal spell, I agree. It kind of seems difficult to get the value on the second part, but obviously the first and third parts are value. Is it six mana of value? I don't know. Yeah. Hey, thanks for the, the gifted sub, Mercury Blue, and congratulations, Papa Taco. I appreciate you. I really appreciate that. So yes, if we're drawing a card off this, I mean, I just want, I always want to assume that we are getting the lesson. No, oh, thank you. Thank you. Man, I love those fox emotes. So good. Um, it, like, I think that you're going to be able to get six mana value off this. I just, I want to assume that whenever a card says learn, like, you have the option to get a lesson from your board, but maybe that's just not the case. Like, there are only 20 lessons. There are only 20 lessons. And there are 21 cards that learn. Hmm. That specific part, I don't know how to evaluate. But I, I think this card's going to be good. Like, good enough, I mean, to take. I don't think this is first pickable. But it is pretty easy to cast in terms of color requirements. Like, a lot of decks will be able to play this card. But yeah, not, not a really high take, I don't think. We already looked at this one, and we have not looked at this one yet. Again, Mercury Blue, thank you so much. Study Break. White one, instant. Tap up to two creatures and learn. Okay. I mean, aggro decks want this for tapping the blockers. Control decks might want this to slow down aggro a little bit. That seems a little bit less likely to me. Like, I prefer this kind of card in my aggro deck. Because you can throw away cards in aggro for tempo usually, whereas control, I don't know, I feel like a good blocker is just better than this, but but I do like this one. This one is to me is much better than the the one drop one, the one drop red one here, and the blue one. I like this white one better than this blue one for sure. Because this to me, this effect is kind of like tap one creature, right? Whereas this one gets two. I know it doesn't always play out that way. You can use this one to save your creatures in combat, etc., etc. But oftentimes this is just stop one attacker, whereas this one can be stop two attackers. So I don't know how noteworthy that is. Um, I think next I just want to move to commons, unless someone else has a suggestion. Much like Snowlands. Yeah, it, it, it does feel similar to... Wait, let me start up a, a little bit higher first. Okay, so... Um, Papa Taco says, are most lessons common, uncommon? Um, let's see. It looks like there's one rare in each color, and then the rest are commons and uncommons. So one rare and one uncommon in each color, actually. And then some colorless and some gold in common. There's one mythic. So split, pl split pretty even. It's like half common, half uncommon and rare. All sorcery. And then... Um, Okay, so then next, uh, Mercury Blue says, I believe they are common rare mythic. Yeah, okay. 
You don't think there are any actual lesson cards at Uncommon? Yeah, I thought there are. Aren't there? Yeah, there's one of each color. There's a green one. There is the black one, the blue one, the red one, and the white one. And then... Learn cards, okay. Yeah, and then the learn cards, the same thing. There's like two of each color. Or yeah, it looks like there's one of each color in each rarity. And then the hybrid one. Yeah. Then Merlin says, much like Snowlands, same amount as lessons, we need to remember that at the start of the format, the masters are going to undervalue lessons because they all seem bad on their face. I don't know if that's true. I, I sometimes I can't predict I can never predict like what the masses do. I kind of feel like Snow was a free-for-all at the beginning, like Snow was pretty open, but I don't really know how this is going to play out. I do think you're probably right that maybe less skilled players will undervalue lessons. Um, are there uncommon lessons? Yes. It seems like the draft, draft pack description says. I guess the draft pack description maybe just omitted the word uncommon. Yeah, does seem like that. Okay, I got to the bottom of chat. Okay, um, so we've done the lessons and we've done learn. Um, I think I'm just going to go with each color's commons, and then we'll move on to the guild cards, and then up to uncommons from there. I also tagged the magecraft stuff, but I think we just go over those as we get to them in their colors. I just wanted to see how many there were total to be aware of how relevant maybe like main decking a lesson would be or something like that. There's also a few cards that copy themselves, and those are pretty busted with, with Magecraft as well, so maybe we'll point that out when we get to those. Okay, so starting with white. I don't think I need to highlight this one. This is a 1-4 Spirit Soldier for two. So Spirit is a relevant creature type in this format. I don't know how relevant, but it is relevant. Um, this is going to have to be a metagame call, like, are there enough aggro decks that this stops? This seems like a subpar card to me at face value, though. Beaming Defiance. This is a combat trick. Okay, so it's big snakeskin veil. Mm, it's fine. It's a good combat trick. It's not the kind of card you'd ever run more than one of. I think ideally I would not run this card, but it's totally reasonable. Yeah, serviceable combat trick for sure. Combat Professor. So this card seems very good to me. I could be wrong, but I think this is one of the better white white commons. So you can move the 1-0 around. So it's pretty good on itself. It makes it a 3-3 Vigilance. It only blocks as a 2-3 on the following turn, but... Being able to give this effect to any attacker is very good. It's only your combat, not theirs, but I, I like this card quite a bit. Its stat lines aren't amazing, but this, uh, this ability is very good. Very good. Like, how often do you have, like, one good attacker? Being able to make that thing a better attacker and let it block can be a very powerful effect. And even just... In a vacuum by itself, this is a 3-3 attacker that blocks as a 2-3. So I, I think this card's very good. We'll see how it lines up with the rest of the set, but just in a vacuum, I think this card is very solid. Yeah, exactly. It's a 3-3 Vigilance Flyer. Not on blocks, but defend the campus. So two bad effects for four. You get one of them. Kind of wish this was a lesson, but there are no instant lessons. So I think this card is playable if you're going to want either of these effects, but even then it's not very good. So like, say a deck that can go wide maybe plays one of this, <clears throat> but if you never want the top mode and you just have this as a bad removal spell, I don't think it's worth putting in your deck. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe every deck has creatures with power 4, but I don't think it's going to play out that way. So this, this to me seems like a below average card but one that's still playable. I do like the versatility. The versatility is worth pointing out.
So this was the only common monocolored creature I saw with Magecraft, if I remember correctly. There are there are commons in the two color, but it's the only one that's monocolor, like the a common, I mean. I don't know why white got one and the others didn't, but. So this is basically prowess. Magecraft is basically prowess that also counts copying. Right? Prowess is, is prowess non-creature or prowess? Well, now I forget. No, prowess is all non-creatures, isn't it? Is there a word for just instant sorcery? Maybe not. Yeah, okay, I got my keywords messed up there. There's not a word for that, okay. So Magecraft is similar to Prowess, but instead of all the other types of non-creature spells, you get Copy. So, I mean, this is all a right trick. This is a fine bear, nothing insane. Um, if it got Toughness as well, it would be much better, obviously. But this has the Threat of Activation type stuff, where you use a combat trick on something else, and this also gets upgraded to kill the 3-3 that blocked it, or whatever. So, I mean, this is a very serviceable bear, nothing, nothing insane, though. <laughs> kind of a clown's poo-pooing my like cycling. Yeah. So this card seems pretty good to me. Um, white often has the kill tapped creature thing going on. And they're often cards you don't want in aggro, but you want them in control or mid-rangey. Sometimes you have other ways to tap their creature besides them attacking you. Like say you have a, a creature that literally taps their creatures down. You can use these in conjunction with that in an aggro deck. Um... This being instant maybe makes it a little bit better for an aggro deck than the sorcery speed one might be, but I don't know. I, th I think I'd still play maybe one of this in my aggro deck, though. This card seems pretty pretty fine. I don't know how high of a take it is. Um, there's probably lots of cards better than it at uncommon. But it's probably better than most commons, right? I don't know. It's like top 30% commons or something like that. I would guess. Is it better than Combat Professor? I don't know. I think these might be the, the first two in contention for best common that I've gotten to so far. I think they're both better than Guiding Voice. Guiding Voice is the learn one we just looked at. So this card reminds me of Eternal Dragon. <clears throat> three for a two one that comes in you go get a planes put it in your hand and then later you can six it from six from your graveyard to your hand and then go get another planes so this maybe doesn't look insane on face value but it is a like a card value engine and the six ability also is relevant for one of for the lore hold mechanic which does not have a name it's just on a lot of cards whenever a card leaves your graveyard um, I think this card's better than it looks. I think people are going to not want to trade with it. And 6 is a lot easier to get to when you get a free land to start with, right? It's kind of like you only had to get to 5 and the 6th one was free. I think this card's actually deceptively deceptively good. Um, we'll see how, like how bad 1 toughness is. Maybe because of pests, maybe it's not as good as I think. But I do like this as just a value card. In the very end game, basically just blocks forever, right? Yeah, I think this card's good. I don't think you need to take it super high or anything, but I think this is a card you'd want to play in your white deck. Yeah, I know six is a lot. But in the end game, six to draw a card is it's kind of like draw two cards, actually. Right? Because you'd get it and the planes. So, I don't know. I think I think, I think think people are going to think this is poop, and it's not. It's not poop. <clears throat> Pillar Drop Rescuer. Five for a 2-2 flyer. Yeah, I don't like the sound of that. When it enters the battlefield, return a creature CMC three or less to your hand from yard. Okay, so this is fine. This can be draw a card, draw a mediocre card, or a reasonable card. I suppose there's probably some bombs at three or less, but you need something to be in the yard, so it's not a guarantee, but it is card advantage if you can set it up. So this card seems pretty solid. 
if you're in the deck with a high number of creatures, three or less. So you would certainly play the deck, play it in that deck. There might be decks that don't want this card though. Yeah, I think both of these are fine. Both of the two we just looked at are decent card value cards. But I think I like the Pilgrim a little bit more than the Pillar Drop. It doesn't put the creature into play, it puts it in your hand. And like, I do like Gravedigger effects, but this one, it has to be a specific type of creature, only small. I'm not saying it's good or bad, I think it's somewhere in the middle. <clears throat> Star Pupil enters with a 1-1, one, one. it is a 0-0. Zero, zero. And you can put its counters elsewhere when it dies. Mm, I don't know if I've seen the 1-1 one, one counter synergies for me to think this is very good. I don't know if there are wizard synergies. I think there's a, a couple cards or two that mention that car, creature type. But this, this card does not look very impressive to me. It's fine. But it's only barely better than just a 1-1, one, one, right? It is better than a 1-1, one, one, but only barely. Yeah, I kind of I kind of thought there was a black-white counters thing, but I couldn't remember. I haven't really seen all the cards yet, or like studied them really. Kind of getting a fresh look here. <clears throat> so this is a 2-mana one, 1-2 two flyer, and you can exile cards from your yard to give something flying, which is not a very powerful effect for 4, but it does trigger the leave graveyard abilities. So I have a feeling this is going to be a relevant card if you get deep on that archetype as just an enabler. So I'm assuming this is a white-red card, not a black-white card. I guess it's possible that black white wants the flying effect, but to me this feels just like a lore hold enabler. So I'm not sure how powerful that those effects are yet, but keep this in mind as an enabler for that ability. We've already looked at this as learn card. So those are all the white commons. The blue commons. We've already seen this in the learn cards. So here we have a frog wizard. <clears throat> it is a 2-1 for 2 with flash. And at ETBs, we get target creature, and opponent controls gets minus 1, minus 0. So you cannot use this to save your creature from the destroy target creature with power 4. Yeah, the flying on that, I'd agree. You, you could probably close out with the with some 4-4 four, four ground creatures for sure. It's not, it's not an... Um, the ability is relevant. It's just I feel like the exile part is probably a little more... A little more what you're going for with that card. I mean, this is a fine combat trick. Um, I mean, it's kind of like two combat tricks, right? Because you get the creature and you get the effect. So this seems pretty good if you have a bear and they're attacking with two bears or something like that. Or you have a, a two, three, and you line this up. I don't know. Not a very high pick, but a serviceable common. Berry in books. So it either costs five or three if it's an attacking creature, and you put it in a library second from top. This card's fine. I generally like cards like this for tempo. They're very good on expensive things, not very good on cheap things. Although on cheap things, they don't usually want to redraw them, so that can be kind of an added bonus if you have to play it on a cheap thing that doesn't cost them much tempo, at least by that point of the game, they might not want the thing, so you're kind of, you know, reducing the power of their top deck. Art's really cool too. Zoltan Boros, been around for a while. Yeah, this card's fine. Um, it's not premium removal or anything, but it is removal in a way. I like it. It's not insane though. You think it's the second best common in the set? I mean, that's a pretty hot take. I, I don't know if I know all the commons yet, or have even gotten to that point where I want to start rating them, but I mean, it does seem like a card I'm going to play. I generally play cards with this effect. It's splashable. Do you know what the best common in the set is? I don't know if it's premium, but it's definitely removal. Um, curate. Blue one. Look at the top two cards. So wait, it's just surveil. Surveil two. And then draw a card. Seems fine. 
Um, I, someone was saying that there are Prismari card in the graveyard things. So if if you need to somehow put cards in the yard, that's relevant. But otherwise, I don't think that this card is that great. It is a way to fix, you know, um, not trying not to draw lands, that kind of thing. We're trying to draw lands. But I'm still not super high on it. It's pretty similar to Opt for one more mana. You get a little bit better than Opt, but not a whole lot better. And I don't always play all the Ops I get when I play when I play Limited, so... This makes me think that um, I'll play one, but not two kind of thing, kind of card. We'll see how good the putting things in the graveyard is. I like this card quite a bit. Probably play like six of this. So this is Frost Links, but with flying. Um, Frost Links is always playable in limited, right? Just basically always. Yeah, it does kind of seem like a bad anticipate, doesn't it? Unless you want the graveyard card, because anticipate puts bottom, right? So I, I think this card is just great, right? I mean, you're not like slam windmill slamming first picking it all the time or anything. I'm just saying it's like a card you want. Yeah, it might it might be the top blue common. Um, I'll tell you in a minute if I think it is. But if I had to guess, like it's certainly in the running, right? So we already looked at this one. This one's fine. But like, do we like pop quiz better than curate? I think so. Maybe maybe the one less mana is good. So this one only ever gets you one card. This one can get you two cards. They both kind of. I guess this one can dig three. This one can find you the third card. This one can only find you the second card with the rummage part. So if you're digging to a bomb, maybe this one's slightly better. What you think Frost you think Frost Trickster is the is the pack mate? Well, I'm just thinking that like there's probably a lot of uncommons that are better than Frost Trickster, is what I was thinking. But I don't know, we haven't looked at the uncommons yet. Reject. This is Mana Leak, a creature or a planeswalker, and exile it. Seems fine. Um, I mean, it's not as good as Essence Scatter though, right? Because sometimes they do have the three. Like you probably don't want to put too many of these in your deck, maybe not even the first one. This is, I feel like this is maybe more of a board card, but some blue decks are probably going to need this in the main just because they don't have the good removal. But I'm always, I'm always, you gotta, gotta be careful with cards like these. Cause I mean, your opponent gets a little flooded and you know, you draw this on turn five and they just have the mana for every single creature they play from there on out, you know, and this card's just dead. But it's probably good enough to play one and maybe board into more if, you know, they have bomby creatures and stuff. But even once they know you have this, they can just wait for their bomby creature till you, you know, you can't play it. Yeah. Yeah, good point. Like some of the creatures aren't even creatures; they're they're tokens making spells. So yeah, like it, it's probably just even worse than than I just said it was, which isn't very good. But it, I I do think it's probably playable, but just not you know not very high playable. Exile target artifact or creature. Its controller creates a four four elemental. So really crazy Raven form here. It is an instant though. So you could get the blowouts with, you know, like fight spells and, uh, you know, people trying to put hats on their guy and whatnot. But a 4-4 is pretty big. Pretty big. You could also use this on your own things. As a way to upgrade your little dorky dude. But I don't really like cards like that very much. It's good against pacifisms. Yeah, for sure. What Chrono just said, you can turn your crap, crappy stuff into good stuff. But... I don't know, I, I feel like I'd rather board this in against a pacifism than main deck this card. But it is possible that there are cards you want to upgrade, like you can upgrade your pest into a 4-4. Four four. Um, yeah, there was a white spell that made an angel that gave flight. yeah, it is basically just that card. I can't remember if that card got artifacts as well, maybe that one was just creature. 
Um, it is interesting giving blue ways to deal with artifacts, I suppose. Like maybe you can beat their 4-4, but you can't beat their bomby artifact. Serpentine Curve, 4 mana sorcery, make a fractal that is the num 1 plus the number of instances of sorceries in exile in your yard. This card does not seem very good unless you're just way deep in, way deep into the instant sorcery archetype. Which I suppose is possible. You just have like 7 magecraft creatures and just like, <laughs> the rest the rest of your deck is just instants and sorceries. I suppose that's possible. Plus you have like more with the lessons in your board. Is that it? I mean, that is something to think about. Like, say you only have 10 instance of sorceries in your deck, but then you also have like seven learn cards and seven more sorceries in your yard or in your sideboard you can go get, you know? It's more like you have 17 potential instance and sorceries to have access to put in your yard. But... I don't know if I like it though. I mean, it's not the kind of card I want to take and build around, but I bet that in the build around it is it is solid. It feels a lot like the blue red card from the core set recently that was like blue red two. That one was like get an instant sorcery back and make one. So this one's just kind of like worse than that, but maybe maybe the, there's an archetype in this that you go really deep in it. Yeah, I think it's bad too. But it could it could be a thing. It could be like I don't know. Like think whenever I see four mana creature, I was like, is it Hill Giant or better than Hill Giant? So like you need two other instant sorcerers in the yard to make this Hill Giant because it doesn't count itself, but it gives the plus one. So the plus one is kind of like it counts itself, right? Yeah. So at the bottom, the floor is four mana make a one one. Who knows what the ceiling is? But the floor is pretty bad. Yeah, well, you need two plus this because it gives it's X plus one. So two other sorceries in your yard plus the or insert sorceries in your yard plus this would be a three three. So like to me, that means it's probably not going to be turn four. So you can't play your hill giant until probably turn five, six, maybe. I don't know. It doesn't seem very good to me. It doesn't count itself literally, but it gives you plus one. So look, X is one plus the total number. It does not count itself because it's on the stack when when it. No, it's a 1-1, one, one, Jacob. Because it's on the stack, it doesn't count itself in the yard when it's on the stack. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I didn't see that, it's fine. Yeah, so it's gonna be it's gonna be base one plus however many instance of sorcerers in your yard. Not counting this, because this is not in the yard when it counts. Yeah, so, I mean, the, no, I agree that Papa Taco, that there's gonna be a Spells Matter deck for sure. I just don't know how like how deep you're going to want to go in that archetype or like how good that archetype will be. But I'm thinking at least certainly at the beginning of the format, I won't be taking this highly and trying to build around it. But you know, you were probably right that there will be a deck that will emerge that will be good that plays this card. But I just, I don't think that it's going to be a common deck to build or a deck that I want to try to build by taking this card early. Um, we have a looter up next. <clears throat> So if the one three body is is good, sure. Just as a looter, I don't know. Um, someone pointed out that there are Prismari cards that care about the yard, so I'll reassess when I get to that, but I don't know. I, I generally like my looters to be free. Even like one is kind of annoying sometimes, like on that snow one from last set. Um yeah, two mana, two mana looters are kind of annoying, right? Like, two's a lot. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's definitely playable, it's just I don't I don't think it's very good. Vortex Runner. Three mana, two, three. If you have eight or more lands, it's a three, three, can't be blocked. Okay, I know that blue-green is a ramp, is the ramp school, so... Like, we saw that green learn card that just ramps a forest into play and learns. So if you're putting cards like that in your deck, maybe this card gets good, but it's not very good on turn three, but it is serviceable. Yeah, this this feels like a 23rd kind of card, but maybe it's not though, Trapped. Maybe it's it's actually like something you want four of in your blue-green deck that gets to eight on turn five, and then you just like have three three unblockables like every game. 
on turn five. That's kind of kind of what I'm thinking. It's like a reasonable twenty third that sometimes gets there, or the card that you know you want like three of in the deck that always gets to eight. Is it better than Frostbeak Yeti? I mean, I don't know. I didn't. I wasn't very high on Frostbeak Yeti, but like Hill Giants are almost always like fine as a bad twenty third, right? Like it's a creature that can attack on curve. It it blocks two twos. Um, Waterfall Aerialist. Four for a 3 1 flyer with Ward. Okay, we haven't seen this mechanic yet. Um, but I'm familiar. So it's either going to be a number, which will be the amount of mana they have to pay for their effect or spell to not be countered, or it'll be a pay life, I think are the only two options I've seen so far. So this one is mana. They try to target your dude, it gets countered unless they pay two. So that seems kind of good to me. If you're aggressive, this seems like a bad card to play on turn four in a defensive deck because it doesn't do anything about like trying to trade it off. It doesn't protect it from that. But as a threat in an aggressive deck is like the top of your curve. I think this card maybe is pretty good. Like if the removal spell they're trying to play to kill this is three or four, this might kill them before they can cast it because of the ward ability. So I'm reading the chat about the, the eight land deck because I don't know much about it. So I'm going to see what you guys have to say. Merlin says, what do I think of it? There's a bunch of ramp. Okay. I mean, I've, I so far I can just think of the learn card, the common green one. Yeah, that you just mentioned. And Trap doesn't know very many ramp cards. It does seem like they could be legit. Yeah, and like rewarded for just like making the game go long, kind of. So on this card... Yeah, one toughness is kind of a thing, but keep in mind, you just don't put this card into combat, right? Think of it as just a, just an attacker in the air. Like the the token that has, I guess the two the black white token is kind of annoying for this card because it flies. But yeah, like I don't think there's a very high pick or anything, but I do think it has a home in a blue aggressive deck. Like I could just see it being able to race them before they could efficiently answer it, you know. But yeah, nothing, nothing too insane, of course. So yeah, I, I think that Frost Trickster is just the best of these, right? It's got to be. And then the next best is probably the Barrier of the Pop Quiz, maybe? I don't know. I think that like these two, these three are probably the worst. I don't know. There's actually kind of some stinkers in here. I'm not super high on the Learn one. The frog's okay. Reject doesn't seem very good. The looter's probably worse than okay. The curve is a very specific card, so it's probably great in one deck. The runner, again, is probably going to be either mediocre or slightly better in the right deck. Again, with the aerialist. So there's nothing super insane here. I'm just like, these three cards look good to me. Okay, on to black commons. Which effect finally has a keyword that I didn't think of? Ward? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sometimes that effect is only spell and sometimes it's ability. This one is both. So, so that's, does that mean that Cure Glass Spinner has a different wording now? Does it say your creatures have Ward 1? Because it should, right? We could look it up. Oh no, it doesn't. It's not Ward 1, it just counters it. Never mind, I'm, I'm dumb. <laughs> Why did I think it worked that way? Alright, so on to black. Arrogant Poet. Yeah, we're going to do uncommons and rares. I want to do commons first. After the monocolor commons, we're going to do the guild commons. There's six of each. We're doing the whole set. We're just doing it in a certain order. Arrogant Poet. So it's two for two on. When it attacks, you can pay two life for flying. Okay. 
Very Suicide Black kind of card. Um, I'm not high on this. It's definitely fine, though. Goblin Pikers are usually playable. To some degree, they're usually like D pluses or C minuses, depending on how good their ability is, if they have one. But I, I think this is in the lower level of good ability. Two is a lot, so you're basically racing them for identical values if you have to fly it every time. Which can be good if you have more creatures or whatever than them, but... I don't know. I feel like there are going to be some better commons than this. Is there a Death Shadow in this set? Yeah, I was, I was like, is there a way to get value for the loss of life? Probably not. Speaking of losing life, here's more. Four for an instant. Each player loses two, draw you draw two. Hmm. You see this uh, shirt design here? There's a quill in this collar. It's interesting. There are a lot of quills in the silver quill art. Like there's lamp posts that have quills on the top. Um, I don't know how I feel about this one. I think, like, I guess this gives black white card draw because I mean, like, the blue card draw cards we've seen are just so much better than this, right? But it, it does seem playable. It's like a dark bargain. What's that card, right? Yeah, Dark Bargain is, oh, you choose two of three. So this one you just get two. So it's like worse than Dark Bargain in that way. But instead of just hitting you for two, you get to hit them for two. I liked Dark Bargain, but I think the choice of the two out of three made, is what dark, made Dark Bargain so good. Yeah, I don't know, I'm not very high on this card. But it's probably playable. Essence Infusion. That's a pretty cute creature that's going to eat your face. Put two plus one plus counters on a creature, it gains lifelink. It's not a lifelink counter, unfortunately. Yeah, this to me feels like the card you, you kind of card you probably only want if you're on the Magecraft plan. It's just not impactful enough for a whole card. You need something else going on here, I think. Because if you're putting it on evasion creature, then sure, but you're making your creature like a two for one for your opponent. And then, but if you're getting residual value off of a magecraft effect, it probably is good enough. Because you are going to want some number of cheap sorcerers and instants that do things in those decks. And there are a lot of creatures with magecraft. 21 of them, in fact. No, 24. 24 of them. Okay. Hunt for specimens. We already saw this one. This is a learn card. Lash of Malice. So this is like disfigure, but slightly different. Instead of minus two, minus two, it's plus two, minus two. I like the swirly art. So this seems like a card you'd probably always play one of, right? And the counter matters deck. Yeah, good point. Good point. I keep forgetting about that mechanic. Like I haven't seen the cards yet for it, but People keep telling me that black white does counters. Um, so how likely are you going to want to like target your X three for plus two damage? I guess every once in a while there will be some niche application there. And I mean, certainly there's going to be enough X twos that you're going to want to main like one of these, right? As just like a shock. You might get into some bad scenarios where. No, I guess you could always just minus two after combat, right? But I don't think this is as good as Disfigure, but maybe almost as good. Like, there are a few niche situations where you're going to want the plus, and the times it hurts you aren't going to be that bad, I don't think. I could be wrong on that, but... Because, like, you don't usually use Disfigure to just take two less damage off of a big creature, right? So that part doesn't really matter a whole lot. But I guess there are situations where you just figure something in combat and then your creature won't die whilst taking out their creature. So that part would be relevant. So. Yeah, it lets you one for one in those situations instead of two for one -ing. 
maybe. But yeah, I think this card's good. It's going to be like the kind of card you're, you're probably just going to play the first one most times, I think. But I don't know how many you're going to want more than one, but we'll see. Leech Fanatic. 2-2 two, two, lifelink on your turn. This card's fine. I like to turn my lifelinker sideways, so not being able to gain life on blocks isn't the end of the world, but... And I guess um, you're making this bigger, sure. I think with this or whatever. Yeah, seems fine. I don't know if... I guess green, white, or green, black has some life gain synergies, I think. And maybe this is one of the more efficient ways to gain life. Yeah, there's a new creature type warlock. I don't know if it's entirely new. They might have retconned some old warlocks. Warlock, to me, feels like the creature type that originally existed, and then they got rid of it. Like, back when the, the great creature type change of like 2006 or whenever. Mage Hunter's Onslaught. Okay, so this is like the premium removal at common in black. Kill a creature or planeswalker, and then you get a special second thing. Wow. Okay, so if you're like black, white, go wide, or black, green, go wide, I think both those guilds seem to have go wide potential. Like, so in a way, this kind of on the alpha, this like makes your pests unblockable, kind of. This card's great, right? I think you just play this card, like if you're black, no matter what. Probably several copies. I mean, I know it's sorcery, but um, from what I've seen so far, it seems like just like spot removal is pretty good in this, but I could be wrong. It feels like something would have been printed in beta. <laughs> like you mean by the art? Or like just the effect of the card. Yeah, minus the walker part. It does it does feel like a very like old school kind of card in terms of the effect. It feels like a very like 90s card. Just very like simple design, but powerful. But yeah, I like that card. I'm taking that card highly probably. Cause like we just played Feed the Serpent, right? And Feed the Serpent's instant. But Feed the Serpent was kind of a lower take because black wasn't as good, but like if black is good in this, this card's gonna be great, right? I know it's a sorcery, but that extra effect is powerful. And like, if you're gonna play a sorcery kill spell, you're probably gonna wanna first main it before you attack, right? So like that, this effect is very relevant. Novice Dissector. Four for a three, three. Okay, so we got a hill giant here. And one to sack a creature, but only at sorcery speed for plus one plus one counter. Okay, I don't like this card unless you're using it to sack pests, and even then it's not not amazing. Just not being able to use this as a trick is like a significant drawback. A cool art though. Yeah, we're never going black red, right? Why, why is it, you mean in order of looking at the colors? I mean, I don't know. I kind of want to just do the monocolor stuff first. There's 20 of each, or 12 of each, and then six in the... We can always bounce back to cards too. Professor's Warning. So this is Snakeskin Veil basically, but you don't get both parts. I know Snakeskin Veil is hexproof, but... So this is slightly better than Hexproof sometimes and slightly worse sometimes, right? Indestructible. But you only get one of the effects. Hmm. I wish this card had Learn. Oh, best common per guild. I got you. I understand what you mean. I don't know how I feel about this one. This, to me, feels like the kind of card you only really play if you really care about the counter or if you have like some bomby creature you're trying to protect. Like, as a combat trick, only doing one of the two things, I don't know. I, don't, I definitely don't want two of this card, unless they're, unless I'm missing out on like how busted the counter stuff is going to be. But it's a it's serviceable card, for sure. Promising Dusk Mage. Three for a 2-3. When it dies, if it had a counter on it, draw a card. Okay, so here's a payoff. So this could be pretty good in conjunction with the lifelink sorcery, I suppose. 
So this would, if you played Essence Infusion on this, it would be a 4-5 against Lifelink for a turn and then always has draw a card when it dies on it. Okay, so that kind of gets you back your card for that you wasted on this effect. And then in conjunction with Magecraft, you're maximizing that again. Okay. So that looks like the only payoff at common in black. But there are a few ways to put the counters on here. Like Novice, Professor's Warning, Essence Infusion. Yeah, there is a counter theme in black white. So this card seems okay. Um, but you kind of have to be in the synergy, right? Like it's, if you're... If this text isn't here, the, you don't want the card in your deck, obviously. I don't know how deep you have to be, though. Like, it seems like you'd have to be relatively deep to want very many of this effect. But so far, that's the first payoff we've seen. Oh, yeah, the one that moved its counters when it dies. You're right. Spectre of the Fens. Four for a 2-3 flyer with a 6-mana 2-drain. With no tap symbol. Don't know if we're getting to 12, but... I like this. Um, the body's okay for the casting costs. It does not block that white common that we were talking about. I wonder if this goes in the same deck as that the white one. Which is like more flyers. I think I like this card though. You definitely don't want like very many of this card. But this seems like a fine card to take advantage of your mana in the end game. And like if say you're racing a couple two power creatures on the ground, this makes the race go in your favor, right? Just this card against two two grizzly bears. Or two 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 threes or whatever. I like this. Not a super high pick, but it's quality. Like a good one of. Better in black green. Unwilling ingredient. Okay, Frog does not want to be part of the potion. A 1-1 one, one menace with 3 exile it from your yard to draw a card. Okay. So is this going to be in... Is there going to be Mardu and this goes in your Mardu deck to trigger your Lorehold stuff? Or is this just some way for Black to get value from the yard as well? I guess maybe some of the lore... Yeah, no. There is a Black Red card somewhere later. I saw a Black Red card. It's like the back half of a modal card or something. Yeah, it's weird. It's weird when there's like some guild overlap in mechanics and stuff. Like having an XL from the yard ability, like you'd want to put this in your lore hold deck, but you can't. But this seems like, this seems like okay. I mean, I wish Menace with Death Touch. If this was Death Touch, it'd be a lot better. Hmm. But this does seem like a card you can put in your deck. It seems okay. It's going to give you the value required of a card. Probably. Especially if you need expendable creatures, right? Like it's kind of like a pest card. Instead of gaining a life, you get this effect. Seems fine. There are common dual lands, that's right. Yeah, so you could... But the common the common dual lands are the same as the guilds though. They're not like all ten or whatever. So there's no like black red one. But you could be playing your black white one or your red white one or whatever. In your Mardu deck. Okay, red commons. Blood Age General. Okay, so we have a spirit lord of sorts. It's also a grizzly bear, okay. If this somehow had vigilance, it could pump itself. Um I know the token, the red-white token is a spirit, so that's definitely worth pointing out. There are multiple ways to give them 1-0 as well, I believe, so they're commonly going to be 4-2s. All the cards are spirits at common. Yeah, let's go back and look at the white co uh, commons real quick. The Aegis Guard is spirit. Um, Pilgrim is a spirit. Pillar Drop is a spirit. Stone Rises Spirit. So of the creatures, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Four, four of seven creatures are spirits at white and common. Let's see even red. 
one, two, three, four, five, six, and it looks like three of them are spirits. So of the red, white commons creatures, what do we just get there? Like seven of 13 or whatever are spirits. So there does seem to be quite a bit of support for this if you are red, white. So this is less likely to be a red, blue card, I would assume. Like, were there any blue spirits at common? No, zero. Okay, so... So if you're playing this card, trying to get the value, you're going to want to be red-white. Which makes sense. I was just checking to see if there's any overlap for Prismari. And there's slightly more spirits in white than there are red. There were four in white, I think. Okay, so this card does seem good, though. Just even as a bear, it's fine. Even if you only have a couple other spirits in your deck. But if you're going wide on the tokens, there are definitely some 3-2 tokens to go wide with. So this is the meme card of the set, it looks like. So it's just like 3 damage to the face for 3 mana sorcery. And then if this is like the 5th one you've seen, you don't have to cast 5 of them, but there need to be 4 in your yard when you cast the 5th one. You can put a dragon into play and that's it. So there are, I think at Mythic, like one dragon in each school. Yeah, this card seems just like unplayable unless you live the dream and get all of them. And even then, you you need the dragon, right? Like, I feel like this card's just going to be bad, but someone's going to get there. Someone's going to do it and it's going to be amazing. <laughs> what dream are you living? The sad one. <laughs> Okay, we already looked at this card because it's learn. We already looked at this card because it's learn. So here's a spirit that has a lore hold payoff. Is there a dragon that does five on entry? Um, oh yeah, because you just 15 of them. <laughs> Lol. Um, I don't know. We'll see when we get to the dragons. Fuming Effigy. Okay, so it's a 4-3 for four, 4 that also has the relevant creature type of the, of the school. And it has the, the trigger of the school, but the trigger is just one. But that's fine. Um, so this card's not amazing, but it is going to be like one of the glue filler cards if you get deep on the archetype, right? Because it does both things that the archetype wants. It's a spirit and it cares about cards leaving the yard. So, yeah. I mean, 4 mana 4-3 is like, I say, slightly, slightly bad for the vanilla test, but it's not like god-awful. I mean, if there's bolts in the format, it gets worse, right? But like most three power creatures cost three or four, so you know it's not trading with two drops usually. But yeah, so you had yeah, no kidding. If it could deal damage wherever you wanted, it'd be a lot better for sure. But that might be too much to ask. But I have a feeling that there's going to be a lore hall deck that's going to be able to hit this trigger like almost every turn. Because there's cards, there's ways to put cards in your yard, and there's ways to just activate the the thing. So. It's kind of like a, like if you're deep in the archetype, it's going to be like a 4-3 that, you know, deals five a turn. Four in combat, one with its ability. But like, I, I don't think that's insane or anything. I just think it's going to be like a functional card for the for the deck. Card you're going to play. But it's not insane. <clears throat> I mean, it could get insane if you could maybe get two or three of them in play. Lightning Bolt is in the format. Oh yeah, it is because it's one of the uh, <laughs> one of the special like showcase cards or whatever they're called. Yeah, but I mean, like, yeah, say you get two or three fuming effigies in play, and then you're starting to like shock or bolt your opponent every time you trigger that. That could maybe get out of hand. Heated debate. Three mana can't be countered. Four to a creature or planeswalker. I mean, sure, you just always play this card. This is gonna be the premium removal spell in red at common. Don't know how relevant the can't be counterpart is, but there are a few creatures with ward and a few blue counter spells, so it's not irrelevant for sure. But I mean, you would definitely play this card if it didn't have that line of text as well. 100%. Probably play as many of those as you can get. But here's another way to trigger the lore hold mechanic. I don't know what to call that mechanic. Someone was calling it excavate. So whenever you excavate, <laughs> Um, so yeah, this card seems great to me. Kind of similar in a way to the, the white uncommon one that's just Goblin Piker with Learn. This one's Goblin Piker with 
Five mana, make a three, two. I like this card. Card is good. Yeah, it seems good for sure. Especially if you can get max value on this by using this to trigger one of the other cards, right? That's going to be the dream on that one. But yes, I like this card. I have a feeling the best common is just going to be this kill spell, right? Best red common. We're going to call it forget this card in our yard ability. Yep. The creature comes in tapped, I think. Let me double check on that. Yeah, the creature comes in tapped, so you can't like surprise them too hard. But yeah, there, there would be a lot of... Uh, a lot of dead three toughness creature in uh, Mike Cunningham's futures, if that were the case. Pigment Storm deals five damage to our creature, and the excess damage is dealt to the controller. Five mana sorcery, five damage with trample. Seems fine. It's nowhere near as good as this one, though. Like, I don't think you'd ever play this over this in your main like if you had three of these and two of these you just play these three i don't know if you'd ever play this if you had the option of this instead there might be some x5s that are really important but the damage to the opponent isn't super relevant on this i mean you are going to have niche situations where you they're on four and they have an x1 and you kill them with this and it's going to feel great but that's not why you're putting the card in your deck. You're killing. You're putting in the deck to kill things, to kill the biggest creature on their board. There are cards that reduce casting costs. Okay, I didn't know that. It is sorcery though as well, whereas this one's instant. Okay, we have another spirit in red. It's a spirit dwarf. Okay. So it's four for a one five with reach. And you can sack it to get an instant or sorcery back. Okay, so this also triggers the this excavates at sorcery speed. So you can't use it to chomp and get value. I do like the reach on this though. It's gonna answer basically every flyer except the dragons, right? Like we've seen a lot of like small and medium-sized flyers already, I think. This answers like the 2-1 flying token really well. Yeah, exactly. You were just saying that. Okay, it, inks the, it eats the ink blots. That's what I was thinking too. Like this just answers the silver quill token so well, like very, very well. And there's definitely a way to get a lot of value here in the with that ability too. I like this card. You're gonna need to want to have the synergies, I think, but it's definitely good. And it's the kind of card you'd like to have in your board for Bo3 to board in against, you know, the small flyers deck. I think we can take this song off. So where are you, Song? And then, what's next? We have Sudden Breakthrough. Two mana instant, 2-0 first strike. And a treasure. Okay, so boosting power and first strike is a pretty good combat trick, usually. And it's kind of like it costs one because you get the treasure back. This card's fine. There's nothing wrong with this card. It's possible it could help you splash. If you're an aggressive deck that's maybe splashing for a bomb. Play one or two of these in addition to like the one basic or with your splash color or whatever. Or just the one splash card maybe. But yeah, there's nothing special about this, but it's definitely playable. Home Shredder. Yeah, I think it's interesting for a combat trick as well, yeah. Could even, like you could have Red Red up, play it, get a white off your treasure and have a different combat trick that they didn't even know you could have, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. The, the treasure token part is super relevant. Tome Shredder, three for a 2-2 two -two Haste Wolf. Tap excellent instant sorcery from your yard, put a plus one plus one counter on it. Okay. So this triggers the lore hold thing. This card seems okay. Um, I don't know. Are you gonna just wanna play this quickly and try to build it as an attacker? Probably not. Because it's gonna be hard to get the requisite cards to eat. Because it specifically needs an instant sorcery. 
I like I do like that it's trying to eat lessons. Like if it was just sorcery, it'd maybe be a little bit more fitting for flavor reasons, but they didn't want the card to be that weak. I'm not sure which one Spell Gorge Elemental is. You can put um, exclamation mark card and then the name of the card in chat. Um, I'm doing it right now myself, but just for future. Spell Gorge Elemental. Spell Gorge are weird. Yeah, I don't know. You need the you need to put the word card. It's an exclamation card and then the card name. Spell gorge are weird. Okay. Yeah, I guess it is similar in a way, but you just need to like tap this. But you can this can come down later after you've already cast the instant sorceries. Sure, sure. To me though, this is you're gonna want like both parts of it. Like getting the eating the card is good for the reason for that reason as well. But we haven't really seen the payoffs yet. I just know that they exist. One, two, double strike vanilla. Not much to say about this one. If you can make it bigger, it's bad. It's good. If you can't, it's probably not worth it. Green. Okay, I think this card looks awesome. I don't know if it's really awesome or if it's just like the flavor and the casting costs like spinning me, but it is a plant dog. It is a two mana five four. However, you either need to sacrifice a creature or pay three. So. Five mana five fours are fine. They're not amazing, but they're fine. And occasionally, like I know that black green has one ones that are basically trying to die. They're just asking for it. Um, I have a feeling like this card's gonna be good. Like you'll be able to play. You'll sometimes be able to play one at for two on like turn three or four. If you're playing expendable creatures. Or, I mean, maybe not on curve, but like you're playing it on turn four after you just made two pests and you're playing another two drop. And now all of a sudden your board is just insane out of nowhere. Because you could turn three, the double, the double pest sorcery, and then turn four, like two of these. Um, but yeah, I think this card's great. It's going to require some building to make it maximized, but I think this card has potential for sure. There... I know red green's not a thing, but I, I was like, there are a few red cards to give haste as well. Maybe that's not a thing, but I do think this creature's got potential for sure. I'm excited to play with this. Give it a try at least. The white green dream. Are we building white green decks? I don't know. Are you supposed to build off guild decks? Maybe you can, but I would assume there'd be three color, right? Because the gold cards are going to be good. Two mana, target you plus two plus two reach and a counter. Uh, I mean, that's a decent amount of value for for two mana. So it's plus three plus three reach. It keeps one of the counter. It keeps one of the plus one. Yeah, this is fine. Totally serviceable combat trick. Nothing insane. Charge through, trample, draw a card. Huh. Kind of surprised this isn't learn. Which one's the app people, the white one? Are you talking about star people? Star people with Bayou Groff, yeah. That is pretty funny. Turn one, the star people, turn two this. And it's a six five? No, no, no. Because you have to pay it. This is on the stack, so you don't even get the counter though if you do it that way. Right? So it might as well just be any one one creature for one. If you're trying to turn to it. Right? Um, yeah, so this one, I don't know how I feel about this card. I don't think I like it, but I guess it's really good with Magecraft because it's only a single mana and it replaces itself and you get a Magecraft trigger for green, no card. Okay, so this is a Magecraft card, right? I don't really see this being a card you necessarily just want all the time in your green deck. But there are, actually, there are a lot of Wither Bloom, like, huge power creatures. Okay, so this, this is either Magecraft or using conjunction with your gigantic power creature which are in black green so this one is ramp okay this is a fractal card of some sort mm -hmm. i think the cards are rare though the one that multiplies power maybe it's not okay so this is six mana make a creature the size of your lands 
So it's probably going to be at least a 6-6. Six, six. Probably. Not necessarily, but probably. This is whatever. I mean, this is basically the uh, the Craw Worm or whatever of the set. I don't know. I'm not huge on this, but it is fine as a fatty. And if you are in blue-green ramp, maybe it's like a 10-10 on turn 6 or whatever. I don't know. I haven't seen a whole bunch of the ramp stuff yet. We know there's the common in green and a common in colorless. I think the colorless one just goes to hand, though. Mage duel. This costs two less if you've cast an instant sorcery. Okay, so it's one if you've already cast something. Plus one, plus two, fight. Hmm. This seems okay. Like, without this line of text, it's still totally fine, right? Plus one, plus two, fight. Like, the extra toughness is pretty good, usually, with fight. So if you're just you targeting your 3-3, three, three, you can kill a 4-4 four, four and your creature doesn't die. Yeah, this card seems fine. Totally fine. Mage Duel. Yeah, yeah, Mage Duel, the card I'm looking at. Yeah, it does seem very good. Just as a... Like, even this line of text almost doesn't matter. Like, I would just pay 3 for the, the bottom part. Probably a couple copies in most green decks, right? No spells to the face. Professor of Zoomancy. <laughs> the bifocal spectacles. Monocles. Bifocal monocle. How do you say that? Because a bifocal means both lenses, right? Or is it just both lenses on one is why it's called that? Yeah. Okay, so four mana, four, three, and you get a pest. I mean, this seems fine. It's five, four of stats on two bodies. The last two cards seem good together. Sure. Doesn't give trample or anything. This card's um, like unimpressive in you know, card design, but seems totally reasonable card. You get your chump for whatever synergy things you're doing, and you get a reasonable sized creature for your main thing. I'm into it. Oh, it makes it cost less. I see what you're saying. Right. Right. I forgot about this. Because I was kind of ignoring that mode of the card. I was just trying to imagine it in the worst case scenario, right? Yeah, so if you have seven, you're making like a seven seven and fighting with it. Sure. Okay. Huh. So you kind of need to make this guy bigger for it to be obscene. Because you're not going to pay 10 to make it an 8-8, eight, eight, right? You're going to want to pay 5 to make it like a 6-6 six, six or something if you can make it plus 1. This is fine. Seems like a green grizzly bear that's totally reasonable but by today's standards. It's a grizzly bear until later, then it's slightly better than a grizzly bear. So I guess you could... You could use the big play on it, and then it's a 3-3 three, three later. You could maybe get up to 7 and get in for 10. I mean, you could just have a tremendous amount of mana and use it twice and then give a trample with this card. So yeah, this card, totally fine bear. Is it better than this bear? Seems similar. It gets bigger in the end game. This one you don't have to pay mana to make it bigger, but it can only be a 4-4. Four, four. It always has reach, so it can trade with like inklings no matter what. Which is not nothing. Yeah, the bigger elf dude. This card seems fine. Like I, I don't know which bear is better of these two bears. Gonna need to see like the set played out a little bit to see which one of these I like better. Because if you're in the like the go big mana deck, they both they both want that, right? Like if you can get to eight, is this one better? And then if you get to ten, this one's better. I don't know. I can't really decide, but they seem very similar to me. This one is just a vanilla two four. 
This like this seems like it could be a really good body for the for the format though. Like think how good this is against the red white token. This is insane against the Lorehold token. Although the Lorehold token does get made into a 4-2 often. There were a lot of ways to make it plus one plus zero. So I guess maybe it's not quite as good, but it still seems pretty reasonable. It also eats pests like it's doing in the picture. This is your standard gain life when it comes to play three drop, okay. Nothing insane. I, I don't like this very much. Um, I suppose if you want the gain life trigger, it has a home. Generally, this stat line isn't that impressive because it trades with two drops. So I, I often actually prefer the, the switch, the 2-3 three, on three mana. Just not trading with grizzly bears is huge. So this is your modal spell with two reasonable things. Five to a flyer or shatter. And then the red one was shatter or one to anything. Okay, so this is pretty similar to the red one. Kind of interesting they didn't choose enchantment on this one. An artifact on the red one. Oh, the red one's a lesson. This one's not a lesson. Yeah, you were just saying that you wish this one was a lesson? Yeah. This one feels like it could be a lesson for sure. Like, it wouldn't be too good. Yeah, because you have to main this for BO1. Can't go get it from your board. I don't, have, I, don't, I don't particularly care for this one, but this does give you an out to, like, some of the dragons, I suppose. Huh. Okay, so we finished the colored commons. We'll go to the colorless ones now. There are 25, but that includes the basics. Yeah, you like the Destroy Flyer Shatter toolbox? This card seems fine. I don't usually like to mess up my mana base for cards like this, though. It's like often you're going to want to think of this as like your 17th or 18th land. You just got to be a little bit careful. Especially in sets that are like trying to make you two colors. They tend to have lots of really intense casting costs in the gold cards and whatnot. But like the having a colorless land can really hurt you. But that is a pretty powerful effect. It's kind of wins stalemated games pretty easily, I would assume. But... I feel like most times rather than not, I'd rather not play this card for mana base reasons, but it is a way to get a little bit of value out of your mana base if you can afford the colorless. So this is a very deck by deck card to an, um, analyze. Kind of difficult to just give this one like a vacuum assessment. This is Ruptured Spire. You're probably not gonna want this in your two color deck. Possible you do, but I would say be careful putting this in your two color deck. For tempo reasons. I can't remember what the what Rogue's Passage is. Rogue's Passage is just like any creature is unblockable, maybe. I guess I can just like I have Scryfall right here. Yeah, so for one more mana you get anything, okay. I think maybe this one might be better, right? Maybe not. Like making your your uh, Dread Maw or whatever unblockable. But yeah, Archway Commons, I don't think you want in your two color deck, but there certainly are gonna be three color decks, right? Like merging two of the guilds, like Teamer or Jeskai, Abzan. So there'll be a lot of options with that. Yeah, the ability to hit with the big guy is more important, but I mean, it depends on what your deck is doing. Like you could be, you know, just a bunch of bears and three power creatures and this one's just better. Like a lot of decks that want this effect don't have big creatures, right? They just need to like trouble, they have trouble closing out the game with the last few points of damage. They just need to sneak a couple guys in to get them over two turns. Whereas like a green deck, they probably are going to want the other version. Um, I'm going to hit the bathroom real quick. I'll just leave this card up.
So how how likely how likely are we gonna be on like off guild decks? Do you think? Like I feel like a three color deck is probably much more common than a two color deck that's off guild, right? Like teamer is probably more common than someone playing Selesnia. But who knows? There certainly will be people that do it, like what Merlin was saying about playing the the one drop creature into the two drop green creature or whatever. Um, okay, so Biblioplex Assistant. So you can put an instant or sorcery on top of your library from your yard, so you're not drawing a card. But it does trigger the lore hold thing. It gives you more gas for your magecraft cards. I don't know how good it is against the other flyers in the format. We've already seen a few two threes. I have a feeling this card is not going to be very good, but there are synergies. So it's certainly playable if you can if you want those synergies. You think we're never off guild? I mean, that's reasonable. Yeah, most of the powerful cards are gold, I agree. Or not most of the powerful cards, but the gold cards are powerful. So you want to play them. Okay, so this is mana fix, does not draw the card, but you get a reasonable body for the two mana. This card seems fine. This is this is a card you're gonna want if you are in three colors. You might not need this if you're two. The art is junky. The whole set in general, or <laughs> So this card, this card's interesting. You kind of think it'd be a wall from like what it does, but it is not a wall. You can attack. So it's possible you could hurt your opponent with this, I suppose, but it's most likely gonna be helping you. And it triggers the lore hold stuff. This card seems fine. Six is a lot, but it's the kind of card you might want one of. But it's not it's not good, but it's fine. It's playable. Most decks don't want it. But I feel like it's gonna be a one of in the mid mid rangey lower hold deck that's trying to trigger the graveyard stuff consistently. It's a pretty good body. Blocks like every flyer in the game except the dragons, right? Stop for a second. You want to say something about this? Hmm. What have we seen that can attack past this? The Biograph trades with it. I mean, there, there's something with Menace. There's no gigantic blue creature. I mean, like the Serpentine Curve, maybe. Or like the green card that makes the land one. It's like this creature, can the Leyline Invocation can attack past it. That's about it in common. Yeah, so like this blocks like every single common creature in the game, basically. Yeah, so I mean, that's a good point. It's going to be like a rock solid defender that can also attack, obviously. It does not have defender, but it's just going to be like a brick wall. You've already seen this card. Speaking of walls, here is a literal wall. So this does not mill your opponent, this is only you. Yeah, I don't know. This um this does allow you to build up your lore hold thing. To give you cards to start exiling from your yard or whatever. So maybe that's necessary for lore hold. Maybe lore hold needs a card like this to 
to get the cards in the yard in the first place. We'll see. Okay, we've already seen all this stuff. We haven't seen this one yet. Okay, so this is a mana rock that fixes. And later when you don't need it, you can draw a card off of it. Okay, I'm into this. This is fine. A lot of low to the ground two color decks aren't going to want this, but it's good that this is in the format. For the slow, slow two color decks and three color decks. It's going to be a good card. Okay, we have the common dual lands. They're identical to each other. Um, come into play taps and they scry one for four. So I, I'm a fan. Like this is a really, a really good effect for the end game. Obviously, if you're super aggro, you don't want too much of this because the come to play tap actually does hurt you quite a bit. But those are cool new common duels for sure. Yeah, Mammoth Spider is often very good. Like, it's all just like metagame, right? Like, the other creatures in the format are what make make the defensive creatures good or bad. I really liked, uh, I really liked Wish, um, Wish Coin. Wish Coin Crab was a 2-5 for 4. That was good in its particular format. As was the 4-5 for 5 in black in that format as well. Reflective Golem. When we cast an instant sorcery that targets only this, you may pay 2 if you do copy it. So this works with like pump spells, combat tricks. Doesn't seem very good to me. But I suppose if you wanted to run this or maybe two of these with like four combat tricks or something that would be kind of cute and then you're also getting your um you're also getting your mage traff mage craft triggers as well right the tax is kind of two is bad but like so you've played this you already have three mana let's assume you have a fourth you play your two mana trick you get to play it again so you're triggering mage craft twice off of one card it's like, this is just a Magecraft card, I think. Like, if you have Magecraft, you play this and your combat tricks, and it's fine. Maybe even good in the right deck. But yeah, if you're not doing that, this card's garbage. Speaking of garbage, this card needs you to be needs you to be all in as well. You need to be all in on like the instant sorcery deck. And even then, it's like just a mana rock, basically. Oh, I guess it triggers off of copy as well. So if you can get the really busted Magecraft stuff to pop off, maybe it's like always a mana rock that draws you a card or two later. Even that doesn't seem that good. I think this card might just be just bad. It's all around bad. But maybe someone goes all in and makes it work. But even then, I don't think they're going to make me look like a fool. Like, even on the, the all-in deck, like, this doesn't even look that insane. It looks fine. Maybe. I don't know. We will see. We will see. Maybe someone can break this. Because there are there are ways to get a whole bunch of Magecraft triggers. Like, there's a card there are cards that are uncommon, I think, that's like you can sack creatures or do whatever to get more triggers and like easily get three or four triggers off of one card. So maybe maybe you can just put four or five counters on this a turn if you build your deck correctly. I don't know. This one is fine if you have the tokens. I think if you don't have tokens, you just don't want this card. Because three is a lot to suit. But you do kind of get the upgrade of the Vigilance and Trample here. Like, one for plus one plus one and a one is a very common equipment, Leon and Scimitar and whatever. But if you if you don't have the tokens, if you're like always paying three for this, I don't think you can put this card in your deck. But I do like it if you have a substantial amount of tokens. Like, this is a pretty good upgrade if you have lots of things to put it on. And it's not too bad if you occasionally have to pay three. But if you're often paying three for this, you don't want it. This equipment looks very good to me. Looter boots, loot, loot boots. So one is great, two is a little much, but that's a very powerful effect, right? Flying and loot. 
It is mandatory loot, which is worth pointing out. You can't like just opt for the flying and not not loot. You have to loot if you get in. But still, I think this card's great, right? It seems so good. Like Raven Wings, the 1-0 on Raven Wings is definitely relevant. But so is looting. I mean, this card seems really good to me. Like I don't think I'd played like more than one or two of this, but it is very good. I think. Maybe, maybe like the creatures kind of seem small in this format. So maybe, maybe it's not insane. Like maybe you're never going to jump anything super big with it, but there are some like big tokens, right? Okay. So we've done all the commons except for the guild commons. Okay. So we have, these are the lore hold two color commons. So there's, there's a creature in each color that has the hybrid casting cost. So this is the lore hold one. We get a 2-2 first strike with magecraft plus one plus one plus one plus zero. So this one is pretty similar to the white common one that costs two, except this one has first strike. So the threat of activation is much more real when the creature has first strike. Yeah, this card does seem good to me. Um just like first strike is so relevant with the plus one. Like if they go to block this with a three you know, an X3, I don't know, they just, they gotta be super careful, right? Like, even an X4, if you have a bunch of mana up, I don't know, this card seems good to me. I'm into this. Usually it's gonna be just a Grey Ogre with First Strike, but the threat of activation on this is gonna be very real, and sometimes you'll deal an extra damage because of it. I don't know how to evaluate this one. This one's kind of tricky. Like, it, it depends on what you're casting it on, I suppose. But on an expendable creature, or say you're just playing it on the 3-2 spirit, just replaces itself when it dies. It seems okay. This is kind of one I need to see in action a few times, I think, to really get the hang of how good this one is. But it, it seems it seems serviceable. You're gonna you're gonna like upgrade your creature or it's like they block your 3-3 with their 4-4. You lose this and your 3-3 and you get a 3-2 back. Is that worth the card? I think so. How often will you get a trade like that lined up? That that part maybe is where this card is questionable. Because you can't just use it for one extra damage and you don't get this value. You actually need the creature to die for this card to be good. You can put it on their creature that dies. So you could use this in conjunction with your kill spell for one more mana to get a 3-2. That's interesting. I didn't really think about that at first, that you can use it on their stuff. Huh. Yeah, you, okay, so you just said that you can get it on their stuff. Yeah. But yeah, what you're saying about the Pledge Mage, yeah, you're like never blocking this creature, right? Unless your creature has just like an insane toughness or also has first strike. Okay, 4-4 four, four Vigilance Menace. Hmm. This seems okay, but not amazing. I like that it's difficult to block and it can block. But there are creatures that can roadblock this, like you're not going to want to attack into their 3-3 and their 2-2 unless you have a trick. But like just a 4-4 doesn't blank this, or like just a 4-5 rather. I don't know, this card has potential. Seems like a reasonable card to put in your deck. Not something you'd want very many of. Doesn't really have synergies, I don't think, with anything. It's just like a decent stat dude with abilities. So maybe it's not that good because it just doesn't have any synergies with anything. It is going to lead to uh, blowouts if you have tricks, though, because they can't ever stop it unless they put two guys in front of it and then... Surely you have a way to interact, right? Like, so then when they go to block with their 3-3 three, three and their 2-2, two, two, you play this on it. You get your, your thing back. We saw this one already. Okay, this looks like a payoff for excavating. Yep. Okay, so we get scry 1 off of our 3-3 three, three whenever we trigger that thing that Lorehold does. It's not a very powerful payoff, but the, the body is fine. So this... 
just seems like the card you'll just play when you're lower old. Nothing amazing. Okay, this is going to be enabling the excavation stuff. That looks like an Ewok to me. Oh, it's Quintorius, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Okay. Dude, he's totally like Indiana Jones, right? He's like Indiana Jones, but an elephant. <laughs> and if you'll notice, like the statue that he's going for is also an elephant. <laughs> oh, okay. The flavor text tells you that. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. He's so excited to learn about history. That's awesome. Okay, so gain two. We can discard two cards and draw three. I mean, this card seems like you're going to want this to enable your lore hold stuff, right? I mean, maybe you won't need it. Maybe you just let let that happen naturally to fill your, your yard naturally, but kind of seems like you're going to want something like this to pick up the pace on your graveyard, right? Sometimes it takes a while to build a yard, whereas this card kind of just does it for you with no cost of card, just mana. And you can even be throwing away expendable things like the white common that I was fond of, like Pilgrim of the Ages. Say so you don't actually want to cast this, but you want to use the, the effect later, you know? Hmm. But yeah, this, this card seems like it has potential for the archetype. You have a hard time including them? Yeah. Like, there's a thrill of possibility and other um, cathartic reunion. They're definitely better at instant, but I don't know. I think this card's got potential. If you're in that, if you're in the archetype, you, you, you're going to want one of these, I think. Thrill and Faithless in this too. Okay, so black-white, we have a sorcery here. Another counter effect. So you get to pump the whole team one. You get to pump that particular one two. This doesn't look very good to me. But I guess if we're like wide with like the inky flyers, like say we have two or three inklings, like this bottom of fill ability could be pretty strong actually. Especially if we're trying to get them past larger flyers. Okay, so I mean, if you can go wide enough, sure. But otherwise, this card seems a little underpowered to me. There's our summoning. This one. Okay, this one looks pretty good. No matter what, it's going to get him for three. Probably multiple threes. The art's pretty awesome. Aim higher next time, chump. Yeah, there's not much to say about this card. It's just pretty solid, right? If they can't answer it, it's going to hit him for three every turn. If they can't answer it, it's going to hit him for three once. Seems insane against, like, creatures that tap. You know, like, just tapping creatures don't do anything against it. Already looked at this one. Oh, we have a Magecraft creature. So this one is Magecraft gains flying or lifelink. Huh. So this card's really easy to cast. This is like that frog from Ravnica that gains flying when you instant or sorcery, but instead it's lifelink or flying. This card seems okay. Like a little bit of evasion or lifelink for race. The versatility is pretty good. I don't know how many instant sorceries I'm going to want to put in my creature decks. Yeah, it's good-ish. It's like, eh, it's okay. It's not bad. There's no there's no world in which this card is bad. Unless, you know, X1 is just awful, maybe. But yeah, this card seems totally serviceable. Um, could even be good if you have the appropriate magecraft triggers, I suppose. Like, it's just like always going to fly, you know? you're playing two Magecraft triggers, you can give it both. Like flying and lifelink, and then it's like, now we're talking. Four mana, two, two, death touch, and you can move its counters over. So you're, you're always gonna get the card value out of this, right? Either they're gonna kill spell it, or you're gonna trade with something. And then, so you get at the very least your card value, plus you get the counters. This card, it does seem like a lot of value for 4 mana. 
but your opponent might just be able to ignore it, like if they're flying over or something. There's an inkling sitting on her shoulder. You just notice that. Yeah, I, th I think this card's fine. I'm not like super excited about it though. But it's kind of like a kill spell, like for a ground creature with like a little upside. I guess if you're the aggressor, it's kind of like a 2-2 unblockable in some situations. I mean, it might just trade for like a grizzly, a crappy grizzly bear, but if you trade for something that costs half of its value, then you're using the other half of its cost for the counters, right? Like, it can't really be that bad. I mean, it's got to be at least like a C, right? Let's go to blue-red. Yeah, they can ignore it. Well, they, they well they can't ignore it if um, they can't ignore. There's no there's no lifelink on it. They can't ignore it if they uh, are trying to keep win with ground creatures. No, but they can ignore it if they're flying over. Blue red. Commons. Okay, this is sorcery for seven, and you get two of the Prismari tokens, which are the biggest and baddest of the tokens. And you can discard it for a treasure. Yeah, this card, I don't know. If you can actually cast this, it's good. I don't really care for this make a treasure part. Like, that's not a reason I want to put this card in my deck. But I guess if you had, like, say, the duplicate copies of this can help you get to the other copies of it. So maybe that is a good argument. But I don't know if you want to pay a card for one piece of mana later. Like, two mana and a card for a treasure is kind of steep. Yeah, if you're the aggro, they can't ignore it, sure. I don't, I don't really know how to evaluate this one. Um, I know there are ways to make it cheaper. So that could be a thing. And it triggers Magecraft, which is a thing. And someone said that there's relevancy for it to be in the yard, which I haven't seen yet. I'm not super high on this one though. Like this one we've already talked about. This card's interesting. Like I like tap scry one, but I don't really want that on my three four that costs five, but sure. So I can see it coming down, being a decent blocker and then scrying on their end step. So like the haste actually helps a little bit in that respect. And occasionally you'll attack for three the first turn. But yeah, this actually looks like a pretty good blocker. Kind of wish it cost one less mana, but Probably be too good at four. And I mean, scry one every turn is not is not nothing. It's not the worst stats ever. This card's okay. I'll probably end up playing this a few times. I mean, and if we're trying to draw into like seven drops and stuff in the end game, maybe maybe if that's what Prismari's trying to do. It seems like having powerful top end things is going to be part of their. Part of their plan and then there's the other take on the deck which i think is yeah i know it's a three four at five which is pretty bad but haste is not nothing like if you're on the play it might be able to attack the first turn and then after that it's like a reasonable blocker that scries and if you're on the draw it's just a blocker that scries i don't know it's not it's not amazing i do think it's probably playable in some decks um this guy i think is actually pretty good so two for a three three wall is actually pretty reasonable in like a standard like Boros against a standard type Boros Boros type deck. But then when you're when you're on the Magecraft plan, the two mana three three attacker is actually pretty strong as well. So like it does both things sometimes, and if you're the Magecraft deck, it can do you know I mean it can do both things rather, whereas it always does the good blocker part. And I mean, the good blocker part's not nothing. Like, it's gonna trade with something eventually. Unless they fly over and kill you. And it doesn't seem to me that hard to build the deck that can just trigger this thing a lot. I think this is gonna be the kind of card that is gonna run you over in the right deck. There's another card I feel that goes with this too that, just like another Magecraft card maybe. I can't remember what it is. We'll find it later. I do think there's going to be an aggro blue deck, blue red deck, yeah. Maybe I'm wrong, but if there is, that card's going to be good in it. 
the 3-3. Three, three. So this is a 3-mana 2-2 two, two flyer, so it's Windrake. And instant sorcery spells that cost 5 or greater cost 1 less. Okay, so this... Excuse me, this makes this cost 6. And they're both common, so... So that seems like a pretty reasonable thing to expect to be able to cast this for 6. So that means if you had multiples of these, you could use one of them to get the mana and cast this on 5. So this on 5 actually does seem kind of busted. Two four fours, And you can also stack these, because it's just checking the mana cost. So if you had 3 of these in play, I know that's a lot, but this would cost 4. So if you had 3 of these in your deck, it seems pretty likely that you'll have one in play to cast this on 6. So yeah, that makes me like this card a little bit more. Yeah, it also lowers the red, the five mana, five damage trample red spell. Sure. Huh. So fork your next instant sorcery. So this does give you two magecraft triggers, I guess. It's like, say you cast lightning bolt and, or this and lightning bolt, you get three magecraft triggers. One for this, one for Lightning Bolt, one for the Copied Lightning Bolt. Still don't think that makes this very good. I generally don't like Forks. And this one is just you. So yeah, this is just a Magecraft card. I think, I think you basically need to be on some sort of busted Magecraft thing to want this. I guess you could be on just busted spells in general, but... Man, this already costs a lot, so trying to play two before it seems like a lot to ask to me. Going to blue-green. Biomathematician. Three mana, two, two, and you get a one, one. And you get to lord your other fractals. Sure. I mean, three mana, two, two, and a one, one is probably just good. Right? Just two bodies for three mana, I think is probably just fine. So this, I think this card's just gotta be good. Yeah, and especially in multiples, right? Cause yeah, the first one makes a one one. The second one makes a one one and buffs your other one one. Yeah. Plus, yeah, it's a common. Plus um, it does seems like, yeah, it seems like it snowballs really hard. Plus there are other fractals. It doesn't have to just be this with itself. It can be this with other fractal cards. Yeah, this card's probably a workhorse. We just haven't seen it in action yet. Probably, probably really good in the fractal deck. Being able to like pump the whole fractal team seems good. Yeah, maybe you can bounce it, do it again, who knows. But yeah, it definitely seems like it has potential. Eureka moment. Four mana for draw to put a land into play. Instant. This card's fine. Do we want ramp at four mana? Maybe, if we're doing really, really big things. If you don't want the ramp, it's probably not worth it. It just draw two. Although putting the land in play helps you dump your hand faster after drawing two, even if you're not trying to get to big things. Yeah, this card seems fine. Um, some decks are gonna want it more than others. Decks that are trying to like go ham on this kind of stuff. This card seems good. This is basically just a two mana kill spell, right? A kill spell that can be answered by a kill spell. I guess there are a lot of things that can kill one butts, but I think there's a lesson that can do it. A couple lessons that do it, I think. <laughs> Ephemerate is in the set. Yeah, I forgot. Like the Mystic Archive cards kind of kind of changed the the draft a little bit, but. I don't think you really take them into consideration. Maybe you do. I don't know. But yeah, this card looks fine. I'm into it. We have a Magecraft card. Whenever you instant or sorcery, copy plus one plus one counter. Okay. Um, yeah, it seems okay. I'm not super excited about this one. I think that... We're gonna have to see the Magecraft decks in action before we really know. It's kind of hard to know the numbers on what we're gonna, like how many instant sorceries you need to put in your deck. 
how many Magecraft cards before you want to start putting lots of instants and sorceries in your deck. Yeah, this seems like a lot of cards from the past. Like Quirion Dryad. Or Quirion, whatever that card was called. Square Up. Yeah, I don't like this card. It's a combat trick, sure. You can deal an extra damage or two somewhere, but I don't think this card is very good. Or cards like it, generally. Wither Bloom Commons. Okay, Blood Researcher, three mana, two, two menace. When you gain life, put a counter on it. Okay, this seems like a pretty reasonable payoff for gain life. Difficult to block, can get big. Starts out pretty small though. But even just a 3-3 three, three menace is pretty annoying. And it wouldn't be insane to get this to 4 or 5. This is like a reasonable payoff for life gain. We saw this one as learn. Target creature gains death touch. When it dies, comes back tapped. Gain 2. Okay. So ideally play this on an ETB creature for max value. I don't generally like this when the creature dies come back type effect on my tricks, but this does like three different things. It gives it death touch and that effect and gain two, which has irrelevant applications. So this probably this card probably just does enough three different things. It's probably enough to just play in your black green deck. I generally don't like cards like this though, but yeah. Yeah, this this is this is gonna gain a lot if you're on the pest plan for sure. And like we have lifelink here, we have another gain life card here, another gain life card here. Well, literally all six of these cards say gain life on them somewhere. Right? This is just a 3-3 trample lifelink. But again, life gain is good for this deck. This is a pretty reasonable hill giant, right? It's an interesting combination. Trample and Lifelink aren't exactly synergistic or anything, but both welcome to the, welcome additions to the team, right? This makes two pests. This one. I mean, sure. It's just a like very residual value, but if you're trying to get these triggers, it, it does it. This card seems totally fine. It's one of the bigger creatures we've seen, too. There aren't very many big creatures so far. Okay. Um, these are the modal cards. I think we should go and do the uh, like white uncommons next. So go back to the search function here. Change common to uncommon. Okay, these are the nine mono white uncommons. So we have a Magecraft. Yeah, the 5-5 five five seems okay. Yeah, it is, it's big. It's like the biggest creature we've seen so far, right? The 5-5. Five five. Okay, so this is a one drop. When you Magecraft plus two plus two, it's a zero one, okay. So this is like the step links of the format. I don't know how I feel about this one. Cause you're not like, so what, you play this on one and then you want to play an instant or sorcerer in turn two? Attack for two? That doesn't seem very good to me. But this does seem like the kind of card that could get kind of insane if you were doing multiple things in a turn. It does seem really bad, right? Yeah. I mean, Magecraft, it does feel weird, uh, Lyle, that it's on different colors, but it's across the board in this set, right? Now, I'm not a fan of this one, but surely there will be a way to make it busted like in one go, you just hit someone for six double strike or something with this thing, but I don't think I'm going to try for that. But who knows, maybe Magecraft is like a really insane thing to build around. This card also doesn't look very good. So this only answers their thing until they pay three at sorcery speed. Yeah, where's the double strike? I know it. I was just assuming that there was a way to give the Stargirl Strike when we haven't seen it yet. <coughs> it's 
So, I mean, this always answers their blocker that turn every time, right? So like sometimes when you're playing the hyper aggressive white deck, if you could just get rid of a blocker for one turn, you win the game. And this card does that. However, do you want to put that card in your deck? Probably not. Um, making them pay three is not nothing, but it's something everyone will be able to be do will able to do eventually. So it seems like a reasonable way to I don't know answer a bear for a second. I don't know. I just don't like this card. So this one auto comes in with a counter. And you can put a counter on something that, oh, on each creature that you have with a counter on it. Okay. So this card's real. Yeah, it's no paralyze. I think this card's got potential. Once I saw that it said each creature you control with a counter on it. So it seemed like most of the counter stuff was like one thing though. There wasn't like blanket effects, right? Like that, the black card, like this one puts two counters on one thing. Um, this puts a counter on one thing, but I guess you could start spreading this one around. This puts a counter on one thing. Right? Like were there the black, white, so this puts two counters on one thing. This puts two counters on one thing. Yeah, so I don't really see a way to like go wide with counters. Yeah. So I don't know, but it, it does seem like a very powerful effect. So like, even if you just have like two creatures with counters, you're still pumping two things. Five is a lot though. But this is going to be a good end game win con, I think, for the black white deck. We already saw this card, big fan. We already saw this card. Seems okay. There's a beast within for a bomb thing or to get their pacifism type creature. This card just seems awful, right? Like, why would you ever play this card? What? This is not limited playable at all, right? <laughs> So you're going to tell me a way to play this card? <laughs> no, I mean, I get the flavor. I understand it's like a Romeo and Juliet thing, but... It's like you can't play this card, right? <laughs> There's not really much to say here. It's just unplayable. It was god-awful. Garbage. Absolute dog poop. Okay, so this is one of the cards I was talking about where it's like one card, but it has the potential to trigger like Magecraft multiple times. So say you play one thing before this, then you get three Magecraft triggers. If you play two things before this, you get five triggers. It seems unlikely you're going to be able to play three spells before this. I don't know what the rare white bear is yet. This one? Yeah, it does seem insane with that. It's tech versus the the minus X minus X or plus X minus X. Yeah. This is also a way to get counters on more than one thing, I suppose. It's like, say you play the black... Like you play this one, and then you play this one. You play Essence Infusion, and then you play Show of Confidence. You get um, two counters on one guy, and then two other counters on two other guys. Three Magecraft triggers. And you got counters like on three of your creatures. I don't know. That's the kind of stuff you need to be doing with cards like this, I think, to make it good, though. You, do, you want the Magecraft triggers, or you want... Like, counters on everything. More doggies. 
It's a spirit, dog. Whenever one or more cards are put into exile during your turn, put a 1-1 counter. Only triggers once. Seems hard to get that effect early. So like, just curving this on 1 and trying to attack for 2 and then 3 and then 4, like that's not going to happen, right? But it doesn't matter how the cards are put into exile, so like, something like Foretold, like Foretold would work with this, but for Limited, we're probably making cards leave the graveyard to try to get this trigger. Yeah, there, there does seem to be like a lot of support for the counter stuff, sure. Doesn't mean it's gonna be good, but there does seem to be a lot of counter stuff. Um, yeah, I don't know about this one, about the dog. Seems like a lore hold card. Like, the lore hold, lore hold stuff makes it bigger, but the silver quill stuff wants it bigger. Right? So maybe this is a Mardu card when you can do both parts. Like, you get the, you want the payoff and the enabler, or whatever. So this is a 2-2 Vigilance that can also gain, like, every other keyword if you have other stuff that has it when it attacks. Seems okay. I think wizard's relevant for like a card. But this is just going to be like just a bear, a normal bear most of the time. I don't know what the most common thing it's going to be getting are. It didn't seem like there was much of death touch. It seemed like there was a reasonable amount of menace and flying. Didn't seem like there was much lifelink either. Yeah, it's good with any flyer. Sure. That's probably like the most likely thing you're going to want to try and do with this. Oh, look, there's another quill. See, there's a quill on his arm, shoulder. They're everywhere. You just got to look for them. Yeah, so th this seems like something you just pair with flyers. Good point. I mean, maybe you get it with the... There's a black creature that has lifelink on your turn. Like, it doesn't really matter if this card has trample, right? So maybe flying and then there's like the common with lifelink. Okay, there's the white uncommons. We do white or blue uncommons. Divide by zero. We saw this one because it has learn. That's the remand. I, I like this one quite a bit. I think this card looks good. Okay, so... Untap a permanent you control that's like give your creature vigilance kind of or add a mana kind of is usually what that does. And then it becomes icy manipulator, including land, if you have eight lands. So the quand like blue green can get the bottom part active and then I mean like icy manipulator is insane and limited, right? Maybe slightly less good when it's on a creature because it's easier to kill. But if you can get to the eight, this card's gonna be really good. Yeah, I'm a fan. If um if I'm not exhausted when I'm done, I'll do the archive stuff too. But I don't know how close we are to being done and have been doing this for th for what, three hours already? I mean, I'm gonna finish it out to the end. Uh, we'll get to the archives. We might have to do the archives tomorrow, but I'm gonna do all the regular cards tonight for sure. Um, I think I like this card. I think this card is just good. Because it can... Like, even if it didn't have the bottom ability, it'd be okay as, like, a 2-2 two, two for 3 that taps for mana. And then, when you do get to 8, it's going to kind of take over the game, right? I think this card's great. It's a cool-ass horse, deer, whatever. It's a Kelpie, I guess. It's a Kelpie of some sort. But, like, a horse Kelpie. How you doing, Mountain Brew? Yeah, it's a Kelpie. Mentor's Guidance. Three mana. When you cast it, you get to copy it if you have Planeswalker, Cleric, Druid, Shaman, Warlock, or Wizard. So like the nerdy creature types. Nerds. Scry one, draw card. Okay. So how likely is it? Like, it seems like these are really common creature types in these in this set. So we can look at like the white common. So... 
These are the uncommons. Wizard, yes. Cleric, yes. Monk, no. No. Wizard, yes. So like half of the white uncommons. Who was it again? Cleric, Druid, Shaman, Warlock, Wizard. No, yes, yes, no, yes, yes. Yeah, it's, it looks like it's gonna be like half the creatures in white. I guess it makes sense to look at blue. Common. Wizard, wizard. Wizard, wizard, is literally every common blue creature. So if you have a common blue creature, then this card does what you want it to do. So it doesn't look like it's gonna be difficult to get that, that to trigger that way. But you do need a creature in play, or a Planeswalker, so it's something. Yeah, you're, you're right, white doesn't matter, it was just the first color that I was looking at. Yeah, but, so blue, literally every blue common creature, maybe not the two color ones, but the, the mono blue color ones. And yeah, like this is gonna be insane if you're trying to magecraft, right? Cause it's just one card, two magecraft triggers. It's so, like this card is definitely gonna be really good if you're magecraft and have the creature thing, of course. Yeah, seems good. We already saw this one, not a fan. Snow day. Might have to bump this song. No, it's okay. All right, six mana, tap up to two creatures. They don't untap. Oh yeah, we need to keyword this ability. Chrono was gonna keyword that for us, name it Frost or something. Draw two cards and discard a card. Yeah, it's the run ashore. I mean, it seems like it could be really good on someone's end step. Six is a lot. Would it be too much to ask to throw learn onto this too? <laughs> I mean, I don't know, it doesn't bounce the creatures, so they don't have to replay them, but it does stop them for two combats. If you end step, I mean, if you get it on their like first main or whatever. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly playable. I just don't know like what the, what the archetypes yet look like, because sometimes cards like this there is an archetype that wants it and the card's insane. And sometimes the card like this is in the set and then there's nobody that wants it and the card just sits there. So I, I don't know, like in a vacuum, the card looks fine. Like if it were sorcery, I would say hell no. But the fact that it's instant, it's certainly gotta be at least relatively playable. Yeah. Yeah, the draw two is not nothing. I mean, I mean, I'm into it. I'll probably play it in some decks. I just don't know how likely that the deck is. Like, it seems like it could be a good one of in Quandrix. Um, maybe Prismari has better top end options. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Solve the equation. Three mana sorcery, search for an instant or sorcery put in your hand. Okay. Um, again, this kind of feels like a magecraft thing. There's like a three mana magecraft trigger that goes and gets you another magecraft, but that doesn't sound good enough to me. So maybe this is the kind of card you only play if you have like some bomby sorcery, for instance. Which I think exists in the set somewhere. So maybe if you have a bomb and magecraft stuff you can play this card, but otherwise I would say just don't play this card. Probably. But maybe there are some bombs that are worth tutoring. Yeah, it does seem bad, I agree. I don't like tutors and limited generally. Most people don't, right? So we have a 1 mana O2 flyer. And when you magecraft target creature you control base power two. So you can, this is just kind of like a one mana two, two if you magecraft every turn, or you can, I don't know. That doesn't seem very good. Like I guess if you were literally magecrafting every single turn, you'd have a one mana two, two flyer. But that's never gonna happen. Is there any other way to use this ability besides just making this thing a 2-2? I, I mean, you could fizzle the destroy target creature power 4 thing with this. That would be adorable. Yeah, I do need some water, don't I? Thanks, Viliot.
Yeah, I don't know how I feel about this one. I don't think I like it. She's got cool hair though. <laughs> and she should be able to reach true enlightenment before graduation. I think you wouldn't really care about graduating if you were already like truly enlightened, right? But not big on this one. Someone might prove me wrong though. <clears throat> I think I gotta change this song though. I don't really care for this one. <clears throat> Test of talents. Counter target insert or sorcery, and then you get all the copies of it. Yeah, I, I would say this is probably not a card you want to put in your deck. It's not negate. It doesn't counter enchantments or artifacts or planeswalkers. Although this does seem to be like a format that is low on those things and higher on instants and sorceries with the 20 lessons and whatnot. Notably, it does not search their sideboard for the other copies of the lesson they just played on you. Yeah, I was starting to wonder, are there like no good enchantments or artifacts? But there are there are disenchant effects, so... But yeah, it doesn't seem like enchantments or artifacts are like a big part of this format. So maybe, maybe this almost is negate in this format. But even then, I don't know. I do, I do like the information this gives. Like, even if you never get another copy of something off of it, you get to see their whole library. You know? I don't know, it's possible it has legacy applications. It's possible. I think there's better options in legacy though. There's a one mana one that gets sorceries. That might be more relevant, I don't know. But who knows, I don't know. This is a limited stream, Mountain Brew. <laughs> um... Yeah, I don't know. This this feels like a sideboard card more f for me, though. Like, maybe the person has too good of the same removal spell and you just, like, really want to get it. But I don't like putting cards this narrow in my, in my main deck, usually. Because, like, some people can beat you in four or five turns without ever playing an instant or sorcery, you know what I mean? And, like, the dead card in your hand, like, should have just been, like, a grizzly bear to block with. But I don't know. The card definitely has applications. I do really like that I get to see my opponent's library and hand after playing this though. Like I love the information this gives. It's like so relevant, but I don't know if it's good enough. <clears throat> Wormhole Serpent, five mana, three, five target creature can be blocked. This card's fine. It's a good blocker. Um, It's a little slow if you're using it on itself as the win con but it's still a win con, right? Like seven turn win con unblockable. Art's cool. Card's playable. Um, it gets better against some some things than it is against others, of course. Like it's a little clunky to try to race flyers with this, probably like the odds of deck that makes flyers that has four power in the air, like this doesn't block them and it doesn't race them. But against like other ground creature deck, it's probably pretty awesome. As a way to like clog up their ground while also giving you a way to win. Okay, let's go for black uncommons next. Yeah, it, for late game board saw mountain brew for sure. Same as the the colorless land we were looking at a sec uh, a while back. Black uncommons. Brackish trudge. It comes in tapped as a 4-2 for 3, and you can take it from your yard to your hand if you've gained life. Seems fine. It's a relatively decent payoff for life gain. Is that its nose? It's like a, like a platypus bill, but more of like a shovel look to it. Yeah, Merlin, all the creatures seem like really low statted. Like, so many two butts. But yeah, this, this card seems totally fine as a life gain payoff. It's a good attacker. And, like, if you have, resi you know, residual life gain that's relatively consistent, this will be a hella annoying. Already saw this one. Flunk. Oh, this one looks like it requires some math. Right, but if they're unblockable... <laughs> 
So for two mana, you get minus X minus X, where X is the difference of seven in what they have in their hand. So like if they have four cards, it's three. If they have three cards, it's four. So this card seems pretty reasonable to me. It's not very common your opponent has more than five cards when you're trying to kill a creature. That's so usually going to be minus two, minus two or greater, I would think. So it seems fine. There are going to be some situations where it's really bad. Oh, I like the art on this one. This looks like straight out of like a manga or something. Oh, blank. Three mana sorcery. So it's Mind Rot and Tormod's Crypt them. Interesting. So it is worth noting that this effect is like a good thing for Lorehold in a way. Like they'll get one of their excavation triggers. However, you maybe prevented them from getting several more by getting them all at once. So that's a thing. But man, I love this art. It's great. But yeah, this might actually, this might be worse than Mind Rot because of that last part, or it might be better than Mind Rot because of the last part. Yeah. But yeah, I, I would put a print of this like on my wall. Like I love this art. Let's see here. Mage Hunter. Never an opponent cast or copies instance. Okay, so, so we have a four mana three four, which is okay. But again, like the stats all are seem so weird in this this format. Like maybe we shouldn't be giving the vanilla test the same way we normally would. Like maybe this is just a good stat line for this format, you know? Because it kind of seems like most of the stat lines are are weak for the costs. Right? Like, cards are only good compared to, like, what the other cards are. So, maybe this is just, like, a good-sized creature for the format. And I think this ability is actually going to be pretty good. It's, like, you're not going to know for sure in the dark that it's going to be good, but I think odds are you'll get a couple points out of it. And every once in a while, your opponent's going to be the Magecraft deck, and you're going to, like, seven them with this. So, I don't know. Thank you, Veliot. But yeah, I think this card seems fine. Maybe it's more of a board thing against the, the Magecraft X. We already saw this one, right? It's a lesson. Okay, here's one of the ones that can trigger Magecraft a whole bunch of times. What's your theory, Merlin? So this one, this one works with pests reasonably well. You get the life back. So this one lets you like draw off your pests, but I don't think that's super good. Like if you have seven pests, you don't really want to draw seven cards off of them necessarily. Like they're pretty valuable in play as well. So I think to really take advantage of this, you're going to want pests and magecraft. Like it's fine with just pests, but it's not amazing. I think this card gets really good if you can do the magecraft stuff, but I think that's like magic Christmas land. So I, I think this card is just kind of not very good. But maybe, maybe you get the Magecraft synergies and you really want it. Yeah. I think that's a pretty reasonable theory, Merlin. I think that, sound, that sounds reasonable. All the things you just said. But yeah, that's how I feel about this card. It, like, you, there's going to be... You're going to need a lot of things to line up to get the value for this. Like, it's not just good as village rights. Right? Because you always get one card in a life, and if you sack a guy, you get two cards and two life. You lose two life. So it is village rights if you sack one thing. and you So it's like worse than village rights. Unless you want the double trigger for the uh, magecraft. Yeah, I don't know. This card seems like you kind of need magecraft for it to be good. Five mana, two, two. Comes in, put a counter on something. Whenever you attack with a counter creature, you get drain. Wow. This is a huge payoff. Like if you can go a little bit wide with your token creatures, this is going to kill them. So let's say on turn five, you already have two creatures in play with counters, which isn't really that unreasonable. And then this comes in and gives a third creature a counter and you can swing and you drain three. They have to kill this at some point or they're just going to kill them with drains, right? Yeah, so this is a build around, but it's a powerful build around. 
can't just throw this in your deck. Like, I don't, just putting the one counter on something and getting the one drain when that one thing attacks isn't good enough. You need other things. But this is a really good payoff, though. It's very fragile, though. Just a 2-2 two -two for 5. No. Yeah, like, every you're right. Every Silver Quill card is, is counter-based. So, sure. But you're probably not going to want this in your Witherbloom deck, right? Maybe you do. Umbral Juke. It's like a football term, right? Juke. Choose one. We get Edict or Planeswalker Edict, but their choice. Or we get the Silver Quill token. It seems okay. It's pretty versatile. So it can like kind of like deal two damage to a block or to an attacker. It can be a two white flying threat, or it can be Edict. Edicts generally aren't good enough on their own, but the versatility of this makes it probably good enough to just main deck. I like it. I think it's good. I don't know if it's great, but I think it's good. Yeah, you don't think this is a build around, it's just a silver quill? Sure, but you can't just throw it in your Witherbloom deck, right? Like, you want to be black-white for this one. Let's do red uncommons. Is that music too loud? I can't really tell. On my side, it seems kind of loud. So we saw this one. Okay, Dust Speaker. Five mana, three, four. When it attacks, you may put an instant or sorcery from your graveyard on the bottom of your library. Okay. If you do, XL the top two cards of your library and you can play those. So you need the instant or sorcery in your yard in the first place, but it does trigger the lore hold stuff when you do that. And then it lets you play up to two more cards and you can land drop from it. I think I'm into that. I mean, you obviously need the support. If you don't have the instant sorcery in the yard, it's not very good. It's awful, actually. 5 3 4 vanilla. But that does seem like a very powerful effect. Like, even if you only get to attack with it once, as long as it's not a chump attack. Like that's a that's a pretty powerful effect. Similar to just drawing two. Yeah. Yeah, you should have one by five. If you're you know, if you built your deck correctly. Or at least like maybe play a cheap one on turn six the turn you attack with it or something. Or this card seems fine. It's probably not gonna be busted or anything. Like even if your deck is perfect for it. Because it's I mean, it's just a 3-4, like, if they need to kill it in combat, they'll be able to, right? So you're probably not, like, you're not going to go to town on them, like, every turn. Although, the cards you draw, like, the cards you exile, you do go to your yard. So if, like, one of them is an extra sorcery, it just sets itself right back up for the next turn. Sure, yeah, the creatures are awful, so maybe this isn't ever going to be in a chump attacker. I mean, they're, like, 5-5s. Five fives. Eight mana. Deals five to something, three to something else, add three. Whoa, this is a weird card. So if you don't have one of those mana reduction things, it seems kind of questionable for eight mana. I mean, you get you can go five to the face, three to a creature, or vice versa. I don't know how useful getting the three mana back is going to be, though. Like, if you're playing an eight drop... Do you have a three drop left over afterwards to play? Like, it seems like you've probably already dumped your hand. It's, it's, this is a weird one. I mean, I know there are ways to make it cost less, but I still don't think I want to take this card very high. I mean, I, I have a feeling none of us are really evaluating the format very well, or at least I'm not yet. Like, there's just some weird stuff. Like the, the creature sizes are starting to like click in my head that like creature combat's not gonna be very traditional. It's gonna be a lot more like stalemates with just like medium sized creatures in play, right? So maybe that green sorcery that makes a creature for your land size is just gonna be like the only like huge creature in the format or something. And that's a common. So Grin Ignis is a reprint. Um this can help you get to the big top end stuff, right? So this can 
help cast the card we were just looking at. That's not nothing. So like play this on three and then on, you know, turn um turn six or whatever you can cast this card after attacking with this a couple times or whatever. Oh, it's to play the Grinning Ignis back down with the three mana you get off of this. Yeah, that's pretty funny. I didn't to make the connection right there. So you use the Grinning Ignis to cast it, and then this just puts your Grinning Ignis back into play. It's cute. Okay, so Hall Monitor, that's a play on words. Monitor Lizard. So we have a 1-1 one, one Haste for one. And it has a pretty relevant ability. I think I like this card. It's in for one or two right out the gates, and then it starts getting your bigger creatures in later. Like on turn five or six, when you need to close the game, it can get a couple guys in. I think this card's great, right? You just play this in your aggro deck. Yeah, I'm into this. Maybe, maybe this is a card that would be better in a different format. Like this seems like it'd be really good in like the Kaldheim aggressive deck or the uh, you know like a Ravnica aggressive deck. But maybe, maybe this Boros aggressive deck isn't traditional. We don't want to curve one, two, three, and you know use this to squeeze in last damage. We were doing more powerful things like this. Okay, there's the really good kill spell with learn. Mascot interception. So this is a threaten or a treachery. It costs one if it targets a token, and there are big tokens in this. There's the four four. There's the land one. So we get two o and haste for four mana or one mana if it's token. I mean, it seems okay. There are a lot more tokens in this format, I think, than normal. But do you main this? I don't know. Kind of seems like a cyborg card against, like, Prismari with the 4-4 token and stuff. Like, taking their Prismari 4-4 for one mana, attacking it with it as a 6-4, like, that seems like it has potential. But I don't want to main this card. Okay, this was the lesson. Shatter 1. Storm Kiln Artist. 4 for 2-2. Two, two. It's 1-0 for each artifact you control. And Magecraft create a treasure. So the treasures give it 1-0. But it's always going to have a 2-butt. So this could be like a 5-2 or whatever, but it's still just a 2-butt. I mean, this yeah, this could get you to your top end stuff. I feel like I would like this a lot better if it cost 2 and didn't have this ability and just made the tokens because like it doesn't start ramping you until like what turn five maybe and you paid four for your two two on turn four and then like what are you playing artifacts before it so that it's a three two yeah i mean it can ramp you i just don't know how good that is it seems like the body is pretty awful for four mana even if it's like a five two it's still not that good uh, I might have to pass on that one. But yeah, if you're trying to cast cards like this, sure. You can see that. The green uncommons. Yeah, there's a lot of top end Prismari stuff for sure. And green blue, I think, too. Bookworm. I haven't seen this card yet. 8 mana, 7-7. Seven, seven. Trample. When it enters the battlefield, gain 3 life, draw a card. Okay, this feels a lot like uh, the green, green, green creature that comes in gain 7 or whatever. Okay, so ETB's gain 3, draw a card. And then you can put it from your graveyard, 3rd library, from 3rd from the top. Huh. This is pretty interesting. Yeah, this card seems kind of insane. Like you just get to eight mana and then win with this, right? Like how do they, they need to like exile it because, or fly over. But even if they're flying over, you're gaining three life and drawing a card. So that, you know, helps the race some, plus it's got trample. Yeah, they basically need to exile it or, like, 
be able to beat you on the next turn or something. Like, this card seems insane. Yeah, I'm, I'm a fan of this one. I am a fan, for sure. Kind of blows my mind a little bit. I, I didn't see this on the spoiler at all. This is my first time seeing this card. This looks great. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of this one. Real cool. Plus, I like the name and the art and stuff, too. Okay, we saw with this lesson. Let's see here. Devouring Tendrils. Two mana, sorcery. Target creature deals damage, so it's the punch. Punch effect. To a creature or planeswalker. And when the permanent you don't control dies, you gain two life. Okay. Kind of weird that it delays until the thing dies. It should just give you the life right away, right? I guess so that it only gives you the life. You can't just use this as a life gain spell. You actually have to successfully kill something. Sure. But yeah, this seems fine. Wish it were an instant, of course, but instant punch cards are very good. Sorcery punch ones, you get blown out a little bit sometimes. Be careful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like it's inevitable. I mean, it might not be, right? Emergent Sequence. Oh, this is the Nummy Spoil card. Okay, so it's search your library for basic onto the battlefield tapped. So wait, it's just straight rampant growth. And then it becomes a 0-0 zero, zero with a counter for each land. So it's either going to be a 1-1 one, one or a 2-2 two, two most likely. So if you go turn 2, play your land, and then this, you get a 2-2. Two, two. Cool, okay. This card seems great. Yeah. I mean, if you if you didn't land drop that turn, it's a 1-1. One, one. I mean, I guess in a way that it's, it can be a drawback that your land is a creature. Like, especially if it's only a 1-1. One, one. But, I don't, it's not like, you know, it's not, it's not usually going to be a big drawback. Yeah, exactly. Could, like, say you're going to get your only swamp, and then they just kill your only swamp because it's a creature. It's kind of what I was thinking. But it's still obviously a very good card. Like, I really like it. It's it's weird that they put the land into play tapped. I mean, yeah, you could block with it, but I was going to say, like, you can't tap for mana because it's a guy. But yeah, that card's interesting. I like it, though. It's good. Fortifying Draft. You gain two life, plus X, plus X, where X is okay, so it's like almost giant growth by itself. I suppose you could make it really busted with some of the Witherbloom stuff. Like, there's a two mana gain four. So, I mean, that would be six right there. This is a sorcery. The other one's a sorcery, but still, like, they don't know you're going to play this card, right? So maybe you do combine it with some life gain to go nutty, but this is probably just going to be um, plus two, plus two, and then it itself is triggering something for life gain. I don't think you really need to play this in addition to life gain. You play it when you want another life gain trigger. Sure. Honor Troll, three for a two, three Vigilance. If you would gain life, you gain that much plus one. And it is a 4-4 four, four if you have 25 more life. This card's fine. Nothing insane. I don't think you probably play it in the uh, the other green deck. This is just a Witherbloom card, right? I think Quandrix probably doesn't want this card. But 3 mana 4-4 four, four Vigilance, pretty good. It's probably pretty easy to get to 25 if you're trying to because of the burst ability there. In the Witherbloom deck, I mean. Like like this with the the gain four learn card is just you're there right then. First try. Magecraft put a plus one plus counter on target creature you control. So it doesn't have to be this. Five for a three three. Not very good stat line, but I guess if you use it once, it's almost up you kinda need to use this twice to get the value, right? Like five for three three and a plus one plus one counter is not enough. You kind of need two, two two triggers, right? I think you need two anyway to make this worth it. I'm not super high on this one. This kind of seems mediocre to me. Four 
four for four four reach whatever creature control with power equals so exact same stat lines it gains trample so this will have trample it's a weird it's a weird ability the flavor text is kind of funny got a lot of pent-up rage Um, I mean, this is just like a like a standard vanilla type card, right? Like you're not going to get any crazy effect off of this. However, that huge land token is going to be XX, right? So it does seem good in conjunction with the, the land token. The sorcerer that makes a land. We looked at this one already, right? Yeah, this is one of the learn cards. Yeah, so this these two together are pretty good. These two are okay together. So there's a lot of residual life gain, huh? Quite a bit. Even this has it. Yeah, so Honor Troll looks like it's gonna be pretty good in Witherbloom. Do colorless uncommons? So we already, this shouldn't be in there. Oh, we did common and uncommon for that already, okay. So let's go back to do the uncommon lore hold cards. There should only be a handful. Okay, there are six. Lore hold apprentice. Which card did you say is good? Which card is good in the green, white, black deck? The. The Arch or the Symmetrist? The counter. Oh, this one, the Karak Wrangler? Sure. Okay. Because you want the counters for your Soul Recoil stuff? I just really don't like the casting costs and the stats. I also don't like that. Like, you're playing instance of sorceries, but you want creatures. You know? But I guess some of the instance sorceries are creatures. But still. Okay, so Lorehold Apprentice. So this is a Magecraft creature. Two for a 2-2. Two, two. When you Magecraft, all of your spirits have tapped to deal one to an opponent. Doesn't seem that insane. Because presumably, you're going to want to be attacking with your 3-2 spirits, right? It's like being able to give your 3-2 spirits ping an opponent doesn't seem that good. It seems okay, but it doesn't seem like super insane. Like, you'd rather be turning on the sideways to attack, wouldn't you? Maybe, maybe they're not aggro like that, sure. But it just, it has like the tap symbol here to me is like kind of like not the deal breaker, but it's what makes this card not powerful. Because you only get the one effect. Like multiple Magecraft for the same turn doesn't do anything for this card, for example. Plus, you can't like attack and use this unless they have Vigilance, which I don't think they do. Maybe a couple of them will, but I'm not saying the card's bad. It just, it doesn't seem like you can break it with anything. It just seems like. A reasonable little bonus to have on a grizzly bear you know yeah there are a lot of spirits for sure i just don't know how relevant that ability is it just doesn't seem that relevant like if i have four three twos i don't want to tap to deal four to my opponent i want to like put them in combat you know especially since there's a lot of cards that buff them too like this makes your three twos four twos you want to be tapping your four two to deal one to your opponent like wouldn't you rather be trading it for a four four or Getting in for four, or, you know? So this one is an enchantment for two mana that builds your yard. At the end of every turn, you have to mill one. If it's a land, you gain one. If it's not, you deal one. And then you can pay five to make a spirit, which will also probably trigger something else. This card seems like a pretty good uncommon enabler for, it's like a signpost uncommon, right? Just does what the deck's trying to do. Yeah. No, I mean, I've seen this card. Like, I knew that the deck was making three, and I've seen this card too. Like, I knew the deck was making three twos, but I also know that you can make them four twos, and like, it just doesn't seem like if you have a squad of four twos, you're gonna be one to tapping them for, for ping. Seems like you're gonna be turning them sideways for combat, but I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. So this card seems like gas to me. It just seems like so, there's so many ways to trigger this this bottom thing. 
the set we've seen we've seen so many ways so far like five or six ways that were pretty reasonable a lot of them were clunky though like they cost four or five to do but if you're paying four and not costing yourself a card to just make a, a four two that seems pretty powerful to me like i think this card's gonna be bossy the stats are not impressive but most of the creatures were weak like this blocks a lot of the creatures in the format like there were five mana three fours, right? Like this blocks those. Yeah, so like, yeah, I know you you pay you pay this one and you get dubs. I know. There's a lot of that where this is the payoff for all of the other effects that do it. Um, there's also there's also the one that's like scry, there's a three three for three. You get scry one whenever this ability happens. So like if you have that and this and this when you pay five you get. Two three twos and scry one. You just kind of all start stacking. The red common. This one, yeah. Blood Age General. Sure. Also Fuming Effigy. And Illustrious Historian. Yeah. I know all of these things stack up. They're all synergistic. It does seem like the like it's not gonna be they're not gonna be many cards to do it much cheaper than five. Like there's this one that does it for two, but it's only instant sorcery. This one does it for zero, it's only instant sorcery. There was a way to do it for four, I think, in white. Um, this one is six. There's the four. This one's four, yeah. So if, if it's gonna be like any card. It's gonna be four, five, or six, it looks like. Whereas like the cheap ones kinda of had to be instance of sorceries, it feels like. Right? So reconstruct history. So I didn't really like this card the first time I was looking at it because it doesn't get creatures. But it does it does trigger the lore hold thing. So this one only triggers Quintorius once, right? Yeah, so like if you play Reconstruct History when you have Quintorius, you get a 3-2, not five three twos if you hit all of the things on it. It seems hard to get multiple things on this. Like there aren't very many good artifacts or enchantments and Planeswalker is kind of a magic Christmas land. It's like, what are you getting back with this? An instant of sorcery, maybe one of these things. So maybe you can get a three for one out of this and trigger some of the lore hold stuff. So sure, but still again, it's only like a mid-range or a mid-game end game card. So this card's fine if you're deep in on like the lore hold stuff. But it's not going to be amazing. Yeah, it can't even get another copy of itself cuz that's it exile. Returned past color. It's a crazy looking mana cost. And look at that toughness on your 6 drop. Jeez, 4-2? So this one is probably going to be really good, though, because there's so many spirits, so it's going to be get back a creature a lot of time. And if it's not, it's getting back an instant or sorcery, which... Um, and then it triggers the lore hold effect again, because it excavates. So yeah, this card seems fine. It's a, it's a good win con, probably. It's 4 in the air. It is fragile with only a 2 toughness, but it does enough, I think. It's a two for one, and the the ability also triggers the lore hold thing. Yeah, like some people like it because it's in the middle of the two, so like the hybrid hits the center, but it does look a little weird. I don't know. I could see it being either way. Like, would you rather have the hybrid one off to the left of the red? This card is just gas, right? Rip apart. Like this card looks good enough for like vintage or legacy to me. Just the versatility on this card is like insane. Creature, Planeswalker, Artifact, or Enchantment. It's like, holy crap. This card just does it all. Um, Yeah, I mean, this card's going to be fine in the format. It won't be as good as it is in, con like, this will be more, this will be better in Constructed than in Limited, but it'll be just fine in Limited, of course. It's just a card you always play. Okay, let's go with our Silver Quill Uncommons.
Closing statement. Rip apart's going in your cube? I would hope so. It's a great cube card. Okay, five mana or three mana if you play it on your end step. Destroy a creature, planeswalker, and put a counter on a creature. Okay, this card seems really good. Like, even if it didn't have this line of text, it would be great, right? Five mana, kill a thing, get a counter. Seems fine. And occasionally you'll play it on your end step to save mana. But there are going to be a lot of blowouts, I think, where they attack their 3-3 into your 3-3 and their 4-4 or whatever, and you kill their 4-4 and make your 3-3 a 4-4 to eat their thing and just crazy two-for-one, right? Like, I feel like that's going to happen often with this card. This card seems gas. Oops. Okay, two mana to kill an artifact, enchantment, or planeswalker. This card is less good. Like, I don't even know if you main deck this card. Probably not. Because the planeswalker part's not relevant. You can't assume that it will be relevant anyway in a game of limited. Um, and I don't, I don't think you can just main deck artifact enchantment removal in this set. It doesn't seem like you should. So I, I think this is a board card, right? Yeah, closing statement's great. But I think Fracture is a board card. Humiliate. I thought there was already a card called this. Maybe not. Two mana, reveal their hand, choose an online card, they discard it, you get a counter. Yeah, this card seems okay. Might be kind of bad as a top deck in the end game, but I think it's probably worth putting in your deck because of the power level in the early game and the synergies from the counter. What's that, no comeback? And Silver Coil are just a bunch of bullies. Oh, there's another lifelinker. It's like the second lifelinker in the set. 2-2, two, two, it's a legend. Lifelink Menace. And spells that I cast the target creature cost two less, okay? So it makes this kill spell better. Makes this cost one or makes this cost two on my end step. Or three whenever I want. It's pretty good. I mean, yeah, this is just a perfectly statted creature. Nothing really to say about this guy. You just play it. Maybe not. Maybe don't play more than two because it's a legend. I can see playing two of this card, though. Just be kind of sad when you draw both of them in your opening hand. Shadewing Laureate. Cool casting cost. Only three mana. Really easy to play if you're black-white. Maybe not because you do have to have both colors. But whichever third color, third land you draw is fine. Yeah, it does make that spell cheaper, yeah. Like this one and this one, yeah. It makes it cheaper for sure. Whenever another creature you control with flying dies, put a 1-1 one -one counter on target creature you control. So their their token has flying, their, the 2-1 the inkling. So that... Seems to be like a common thing that will die for them, okay? So this this seems like a pretty reasonable way to get counters. If you have the token. Because it doesn't trigger off itself. There were a few others. There was like the two threes that we were looking at in both black and white. Two mana, two two, magecraft. Target creature gets 1-0, -oh, not just it. This card's okay. It's only barely better than the, the white one that just does itself though it is useful to be able to put the effect wherever you want but it's not like dramatically more powerful blue red uncommons creative outburst seven mana five damage to any target look at the top five cards one in the hand, rest on bottom, and another thing that makes a treasure. I mean, this card seems great if you can cast it. And we know that there are ways to make it cheaper, so sure. Seems like a pretty reasonable top end kill spell. I mean, look at top five, put one in your hand is, is very, very good after just killing like the best creature on the board. So if you can get to this casting cost, then hell yeah, put this card in your deck. Yeah, about all there's to say about it. If you can cast it, it's great. 
Yeah, it seems great if you can cast it is just the motto of Prismari. Expressive Iteration. Two mana sorcery, look at the top three cards, one in a hand, one bottom, one exile, you can play the exile one. Okay, so this does not seem synergistic with the outrageously expensive things. However, you could put the outrageously expensive thing in your hand and then maybe exile a land. Okay, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, this does seem really good because you can play the land as the exiled one. So even if you just turn two this, odds are pretty reasonable you'll hit a land, or turn three rather. Play this on turn three to hit your third land drop. Yeah, I like this card a lot. This card's great for sure. Maelstrom Muse. We have the hybrid casting cost. Four mana, two, four, when it attacks. Okay, this seems like a really good way to make your, the spells cheaper. So at the very least, if you can attack with this, you make your big things cost two less. But you might be able to do even more. Yeah, it does seem very synergistic with Prismari. Like, just making this cost five is really incredible. There's a huge difference between seven and five. Draw four, discard two, unless you discard an instant sorcery. Okay, that's pretty cool. Especially good if you're making it cheaper. Sure. I mean, this seems fine even if you're not making it cheaper. If it were sorcery, I wouldn't like it, but... Magecraft, when you cast or copy an instant sorcery, can't be blocked. If it has five or amount of value or greater, put a counter on it. Okay. This seems really good with the the two mana, the two mana three three that loses defender when you magecraft. Like they're just like the same archetype, the same deck wants both, right? Just two mana thing that hits hard that hits hard when you magecraft. Yeah. So I don't know if like the deck that goes big wants this one as much or if you're trying to build like a more streamlined version for this one. We'll see as the deck puts itself together in during draft. So this one is a legendary uncommon. Three for a one four. You can pay two and bounce it to copy one of your instants or sorceries. So you can't activate this unless you have a spell on the stack. You can't just like bounce this to save itself when you want to. Yeah, you know, I was thinking that too. Like, there are two archetypes for it. This card seems okay. It's almost more just good because of its stat line, though, honestly. But I, I guess you are going to be wanting to copy some powerful things at some point, but the stat line is good to, like, get you there. Like, this just blocks bears for a little while and then, uh, and then does the powerful thing later. Like copying either of these seems fine. Might be difficult to copy this one. Go to blue green uncommons. Might have to do the rares tomorrow. I'm getting a little getting a little exhausted. Let's see here. Ether Helix. Five mana sorcery. Balance a permanent. Regrowth the permanent. Seems like not good enough for five mana, but you can bounce land, bounce tokens. But if this isn't killing a token, is that good enough for five? It's a sorcery. Hmm. Yeah, it's definitely good enough to hold the ground. No, I agree. This card's good. I was just thinking like, you're probably not going to use the copy part till much later. Like first it's just going to be like a horn turtle or whatever. Yeah, I don't know how I feel about this one. It doesn't seem good enough. Also like target permanent card. It, like it's very restrictive in this format, right? Like there's so many good instances of sorceries. Hmm. I mean, it's, it's, this is okay. It's just not, a, it's not amazing. I wish it were an instant. I do like that it allows you to bounce land, although you're not going to choose land very often, but most, most bounce spells don't hit land anymore. Okay. 
We either get Fight Spell or Negate Mana Leak. I like it. Versatile. Kind of an answer for a creature, answer for a not creature. I'm into this one. This one's pretty good. Very efficient. Instant fight spells are always really good. Yeah, it seems good. Let's see here. I like the art on this one. Okay, draw a card for each different power among creatures you control. That does not sound very good. You can't just run this out on turn three to draw two cards. Like you'll get to draw one card if you run this out on three, maybe. Yeah, I don't I don't think this one's very good. It could be it could be really powerful in the end game on like a huge board, but that seems like asking a lot. The multiple fractal guy? Okay, I don't know if it's good. Maybe that's like one way to set this card up, but that doesn't make the card good, I don't think. Cause yeah, so like if you play like two of that guy, you're gonna have what? Like two two twos, a one No wait. Like that guy's always a two two. Yeah, if you play three of those, then you'll have three two twos, a one one. No, you have four two twos, a one one, and a three three, won't you? You'd still only draw three off that. You'd have a one one, a whole bunch of two twos, and a three three. The Biomancer itself gets the plus too. Because it's not a fractal. See, it's a human wizard, so it creates a zero zero. And then you put a one one on each fractal, it doesn't buff itself. So, like, the three mathematicians would all be two twos. And then you would have a 1-1, one, one, a 2-2, two, two, and a 3-3. Three, three. Yeah, so that's only draw 3. That's like... Doesn't seem very good to me. But... I don't... I Like, I, it seems really hard to set this up for draw more than draw 3. And even draw 3 is not really that good because of the setup required. But, I mean, I'm sure someone's going to make this work and they're going to draw 5 and it's going to be amazing. But, like, I don't think that you should just put this card in your deck. I think it's I think this is like Magic Christmas Land summed up for three mana. Quandrix Apprentice. So two two Magecraft. Look at the top three cards of your library. You may reveal a land put in your hand. This card seems great. I mean Well, I don't know if great greats maybe a little too strong, but this gives you value over over the game. This is gonna help you keep hitting your land drops for the eight land matter stuff, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a harder to set up Divination that if you go balls deep, you might be able to get five off of it, but that's, like, living the dream. Um, yeah, I, I think this card's just solid, and you probably just play this. Like, I guess there are decks that won't have enough Magecraft for it, but even if you just trigger this once or twice, this seems great. I love free lands, especially also in the, the deck that wants to hit eight land drops, right? That's one of the their uh, their goals. Yeah, each each guild is hit, is getting the themes hit pretty well for sure. So we got a turtle druid here. This one puts a forester island directly into play. Heck yeah, on the team. Good stats, I guess, for its, or reasonable stats for its body for what the format is looking like. This is a good one for sure. It'll, our legendary of the guild. So I guess each one has a legendary, right? At uncommon, it's like their star pupil or whatever. So this one lets you put a land from your hand into battlefield or draw a card if you have it. Oh, I like this card a lot. So it's probably only going to put like one land into play. Like say on turn three, you put your fourth land into play as well. But by then you're just out of lands to put into play. So she doesn't really help you get to the eight per se, unless you're drawing cards maybe. Drawing extra cards. Yeah. Hey, what's up? There it is. How you doing? Doing a set review. True. College basketball is finally over. Thank God. So the draw the draw card part seems totally fine and doable because the deck is trying to get to eight anyway. 
I feel like there's going to be a little period in between these two abilities where it doesn't do anything. But that's fine. It's just a two drop. You're like not investing a whole bunch into the card. So this seems like a good end game payoff. And you'll probably get like one ramp out of the ability. Black green uncommons are next. Okay. Demogoth Woe Eater. So this is a 7 6 for 4 that requires you to sacrifice a creature at the beginning of your upkeep. So we already know that we have a way to make this trample at common that draws a card. So that's pretty reasonable. When you do sacrifice this, each opponent discards a card, you draw, and you gain two. So it replaces itself when it dies, so that's good. And hopefully you get an attack or two out of it. Or maybe you go way synergy deep on it and get like seven pests out of it, or make it, make it in for trample a couple times. So yeah, this seems, this seems good. You bet they all gain life. Yeah, they probably do. So this seems very synergistic for what Black Green's trying to do. The huge power... The things to sack. Each player edicts. And if you sacrifice a permanent this way, you can return a different permanent from your graveyard to your hand. I don't generally like edicts in limited very much. I don't know how deep Witherbloom is really trying to go on the regrowth effect. It doesn't seem like it's a huge part of its strategy. It almost seems like the regrowth thing is more of a lore hold effect. I don't know about this one. This one doesn't seem that 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 good. It is kind of a two for one, I guess. Because you get your card back, but you can't get the thing you sack. But I'm assuming you're sacking a pest and getting back a good thing. But maybe they also have an expendable token to sack, so the edict part isn't very good anyway. I don't know. This one's kind of hard to tell if it's gonna be a playable or not. Yeah, you definitely want to sack a pest. And you should have a pest somewhere, right? So whenever we gain, they lose one. So it's not per damage it's for every batch. Sacrifice another creature for XO, where X is the sacrifice creature power. So if we're sacking pests, it's just fire breathing. But if we're sacking this guy, it's plus seven. So that's a thing. So you can even like, you just like attack with this. They block this one instead, but you just throw it onto this anyway. I think that seems like a thing that'll happen up a lot, right? Yeah. I have a feeling this card's gonna be good. Yeah, it seems good with a life gain for sure. This spell costs two less if you've gained life, and it's just destroy target anything that's on a land, okay? So this is good at four or two. So this card seems incredible. Yeah. Like even if it didn't have this clause, it would still be a slam include. And this only makes it better, because there's tons of residual life gain in black-green, so... That seems great. I'm gonna have to change this track here, this one's kind of annoying me. Okay. Next song, or next card, Tend the Pests. Looks like Marilyn Manson. Okay, two mana as an additional cost to cast it, sack a creature, and we get X power in pests. Okay. So this is a very like archetype specific synergy required type of card. Because usually you don't want to trade your creature for its power in one ones. But if you can go cheap creature with very big power, maybe you do. So we have a seven six for four that also gives us stuff when it dies. So say you just immediately sacrifice this to this. For six mana you get seven one ones. They discard a card, you draw a card, you gain two life for your two cards. Seems like enough. It is an instant too, so you can combat with this first, see what happens, you can block with it first, etc, etc. The fact that this is an instant makes it pretty good, I think. This would be garbage at sorcery, but it's fine at instant, right? Yeah, I think I'm into this if you're if you're into that part of the archetype. The part that can make the big power creature, but if you're just on the pest side, like you don't ever have like one tall thing, you probably don't want this. Hmm. 
This one, just a bear that mage crafts for a drain one. Seems okay. Gives you the residual life gain, right? Whenever you mage craft. It also triggers your life gain stuff. That's probably good enough. But without like wanting the life, this might not be good enough. Just like in a vacuum, it doesn't seem powerful enough to add a drain to all your instant sorceries. For the two color bear. Um, so we're done with all the uncommons. Now we can go to, I guess, let's do the MDFCs before we do the regular rares. Yeah. Okay, so Augmenter Pugilist is a 3-mana three 3-3 three, three with Trample that wants the 8 land thing in Quandrix. So you don't have to be on the 8 land thing because it's still just 3-mana three 3-3 three, three Trample, right? Then the other side is choose a creature I control. Oh, okay, so my whole team becomes one of my creatures. A sorcery though? Mm, I don't know. So this card this card isn't as good as just the creature, probably. But this could be insane in a go wide, right? But I don't think blue. Yeah, you know, like Prismari probably doesn't want this half, but maybe Quandrix does. I don't know. It's hard to evaluate that one. But like the front half seems pretty good. A 3 3 trample that can become an 8 8 trample. I like this one. Blex is pretty cool. I think that like just this Lording Pests is probably pretty good. They are all good with themselves for constructed. Like this one requires life to pay. And if you just play multiples of the, like the second one of this you play just gains you four life, right? It becomes three mana gain four life on duplicates, which can feed the other half. So this half also looks pretty good because remember black green is gaining tons of life. So this is look at five cards and put any number of them in your hand. So let's say you want three of the five cards, you pay nine life for three of the top five. That's pretty good. When you have the residual life gain, that's totally reasonable. Ask. Um, I think, let's see here. I think after I finish these MDFCs, I might call it a night and come back and do the all of the regular rares tomorrow. We'll see after I feel about this, after this one. Thought I was gonna be able to do the whole set, but we'll see, it's a lot of reading. Extus. So it's a pretty difficult casting cost to hit, but we have a 2 4 double strike. And whenever we magecraft, we get a non legendary creature from graveyard to hand. Okay. So I don't know how much of a drawback the legendary part is. We know that there's an uncommon legendary in each guild that are good. So not being able to get like the black white legendary creature in your uncommon slot is like, it's a reasonable thing to be. A little sad about but you can get like all of your commons back the other half is now this is the weird one right like there is no black red in this Ooh, we have a 46 raiding party from florida man thank you florida man good to see you so we're we've done all of the commons and all of the uncommons so far we are on the MDFC rares, and we haven't done the regular rares yet. So is this like the only card that's not a guild card? Like it feels like everything is either monocolor or the two color cards are appropriately colored. It seems like it's the only one that's got a weird, a weird pairing. How's it going? Yeah, I mean, it's looking pretty good. Um, it seems like the stat lines on creatures are much weaker than they normally are. And Merlin in chat was thinking that maybe it's because, like for example, like five mana two four, six mana four two, it just seems like so many of the stats are like weaker than we're used to being for creatures, like four for a four three instead of this being like a four four or something, four for a one five. Just all the stats, all the creatures seem underpowered in terms of just their stat lines. And um, Merlin was thinking it was because they're really trying to focus on being a spell set. Like instants and sorceries are what really matter for this with the magecraft and with all the lessons and the learn. 
like sorceries are a big part of this format and it seems to me like the creature stat lines took a big hit because you know you can't kill people with instance of sorceries if they're just good creatures in play the good creatures in play are going to kill you right and i can't figure out why there's a black red card but there's a black red card so is this is this half good so we sack one thing to it it costs six and if you're paying six for this you get a three six and an edict and three six is good like that's a good attack trigger yeah, I mean, this card seems fine. Not amazing. I mean, edicts are never that good, right? Seems like the front half is just pretty good. So if you're playing Silver Quill, how do you getting the red mana for the other half to have the option of playing the back half? You just have to put a mountain in your deck? I know there were treasure cards, but if the treasure cards weren't, weren't in Silver Quill, were they? I can't really remember. Okay, so Flame Scroll Celebrant seems like a reasonable card to just take later in the pack but yeah this is not a first pick but it's you know it's a pretty reasonable goblin piker the fire breathing ability here but this feels more like a constructed card to me and this is certainly more of a constructed card right this is a good thing to have access to in your deck i guess if you are lore hold and you usually play the the creature half this is a reasonable card to win you the game in some niche scenarios you just have you know lethal on board and you know you need them to not play an answer kind of thing but i think most of the time you're just going to expect this to be a slightly better than goblin piker goblin piker yeah it's not great i hope you had a good stream florida men i excited to check you next time i check you Always enjoy your show. And thank you again for the raid. Your jazz, Jadzy. Eight is a lot, but we know that Blue Ring gets to eight. I mean, they're trying to get to eight. They want to get to eight. This is only a five, man, eight mana five, five, huh? This is, again, these creature stat lines are so, so backwards to what we're used to. Um, So when we Magecraft, we get to reveal a card and then... Either put it on the battlefield if it's land, or cast it by paying one? Wow. But first we had to have played an instant or sorcery. And then we have to get lucky and do it being a not land. So, but, but being able to play an instant or sorcery and just have one laying over is not that big of a deal. So that's incredibly powerful ability. You pay anything off of it. Okay. So that card's just busted if you get it in play. Yeah, it ignores timing too. It certainly does. It certainly does. So if you mage, if you instant or sorcery before blockers are declared, you can put your 10 mana creature into play or whatever filthy thing you're trying to do. And then the back half of our merit correctly is not very good, right? So when you have four mana, you very likely do not have very many cards or many lands in your hand. But I suppose if you're drawing cards, it could let you get a couple more into play. Like, say you play a Divination on turn three or whatever. Maybe you drop a couple lands with this. And then you're going to want to get this back because the other half is so busted, right? So, that means you want to have land in your hand plus a card to discard? This just doesn't seem very likely. It almost seems like you just never cast the green half and you just wait for the blue half. But maybe, maybe if you're flooded, maybe you cast the green half once or something. It does go back to hand, but only if you discard a card. And you have to have eight lands, so you can't just use it to put your fifth and sixth into play. You need to use it to put your seventh and eighth into play, or your eighth into play, and have a card to discard. It just, I don't know, it seems a little much of a stretch, but yeah, it just seems like you just kind of wait to play the blue part. But maybe, maybe it puts a couple into play, who knows. Here's another green blue card. Okay, this one is a Grey Ogre that can... Hmm. So it's like a Dryad that draws card, that draws lands, or puts a study counter on it, okay. And then you get to make creatures that are equal to the mana costs among the study cards. 
So this seems pretty clunky and slow, but it is letting you, it is letting you draw lands, which is not irrelevant. And the green blue deck wants lots of lands. So the first ability is fine. Second ability is very residual. Seems like you might activate that once very late, very much later. Yeah, so this this card seems to me like it's mostly just about that top ability. Because if the bottom ability ever is a threat, they should be able to kill your 2-2. Two -two. So, yeah, this card seems fine on the front half. Nothing amazing. On the back half... Okay, the back half draws cards. Okay, so the constructed implication is that the back half can draw the front half's cards. But in limited, if you're playing this one... So first you need to pay X, and then later you can just pay blue blue. Because... Oh, you know, and it's a Phantom Monster? Okay. And it, I think Phantom Monster is probably pretty good in this format. Because we've seen like the common 2-3 flyers, and then like no other big flyers, right? I know there's some dragons coming at Mythic, but... This seems like one of the biggest flyers we've seen, yeah. So it's a 3-3 flyer for 4, which seems good for the format. And then, I mean, I'm going to use this to draw cards, aren't you? Like, yeah, attack for 3 in the air, but... It, I mean, it draws a card every single time, assuming you've paid 3, you know, at least as many times you're trying to draw, right? Like, you can pay 5 once and then pay 2 several times. Yeah. Yeah, this card seems great. Like, I like the blue half way more than the green half. Because you're gonna want to, you're gonna want to activate this for like a, a reasonable number once or twice, and then you can just start paying blue if you want, and then just draw the cards that you already know about, right? You refresh it every once in a while, or you've got a three-three flyer. Yeah, I think this card's great. Let's see this one. Okay, the top ability is not very relevant. The bottom ability is pretty reasonable. It's going to protect your other stuff or make them kill this and trade for a card. And then the Planeswalker side is fine. So you can rummage or you can rummage a creature to draw two. You can Corpse Dance. Are there... Are there creatures that are good to haste from the yard? Like, I don't think we've seen a creature that I care about paying six mana to trick in from the yard. Plus, how am I getting it there? Oh, I'm getting it there with its up, okay. And then you get Pandemonium. I don't know. Six is a lot for this. It doesn't really defend itself very well. Like, the minus two, the creature... Oh, your next upkeep, okay. So the creature can block once. But yeah, I don't know. I, I'm kind of medium on the Luka. I'm also kind of medium on the creature. I don't know if you take this card very high. Maybe you do. Maybe if you like line it up against the lore hold on commons and you'll see it's just like it's probably enough value to take over them. And be lore hold, I mean. I guess you can play this in Silver Quill or in Prismari. Is Luka good in Prismari? I don't know. Prismari seems like way into the spell archetype. Yeah, I don't know how, like Luka doesn't even seem good in Prismari, does it? Let's take a look at this one. Pestilent Cauldron. So we discard a card, we get a pest. Or we can mill equal to the life we've gained. So that could be a win con, right? Because there is like an absurd amount of life gain in Witherbloom if you want. So maybe maybe that could be a plan B. And then the third is Exile 4 draw card. It's weird how there's been multiple things that like are implying you're going to be exiling cards from their graveyard. But then like lore holds a thing. So I think it's kind of funny that it's like, I don't know, some of these cards just seem questionable if your opponent's red-white. You know? It's like, oh, and they get a 3-2. Okay, sweet. It's like, I get to draw a card, but they get a 3-2. Because <laughs> they have Quintorius. Okay. Return up to two target creature land or planeswalker cards from your graveyard hand. Each player gains four. 
It doesn't list all of the permanent types. You can't get enchantments or artifacts. It's basically just creature land here. I don't understand why both players gain four, but sure. So it's possible if it's the mirror match, they get some triggers off that, which could be pretty bad. Um, yeah, I don't know how I feel about this one. Like, trading a card for a pest is not good value, generally. Milling opponent for life you gain doesn't seem that insane, but you could build around it. And then exiling four cards to draw a card? Sure, it's not awful, but it's not good. I just don't know if these three things combined is good enough. I don't think I'm super high on this card. I could be wrong, it could just be like some insane synergy pile thing. Yeah, single graveyard, also another drawback, right? Like, you can't do two and two or something. That seems kind of hard to pull off on a consistent basis. Plarg, Dean of Chaos. It's legendary. Taps to Rummage. And then... Cascade of some sort? Yeah, it's just straight up Cascade, right? Oh, doesn't hit legendary? Yeah, so Cascade 3 for non-legendary. And rummage. This card seems good. Like that's a pretty good endgame ability, right? Just five mana play a random three drop. I'm into that. Seems really good. Man, this card seems great. What's the back half? Other tapped creatures 1-0, other untapped creatures 0-1. Whenever you attack, you untap your team and then you can tap any of them so you get to choose which effect your attackers have and whether or not they're blocking next turn your blockers are always buffed your yeah this card's pretty sweet i don't know if it's as good as the red half this one kind of requires you to have other stuff going on i think it just does barely anything by itself yeah it's just a one three doesn't even buff itself but the potential is there for sure if you're wide. Whereas the red one is just always good, right? Like I can't see this card being bad. <clears throat> Mythic Planeswalker, you say? So I might never see this card in play. So this one has a static of your instant sorcerer's cost one less, so it's obviously good in the Magecraft decks stuff. Plus one is damage to opponent. If you've drawn three cards, it's three instead. Okay, that's whatever. Minus four... Whenever you Magecraft, oh no, whenever you Instant Sorcery, you can pay two if you do copy it. Yeah, I don't really care for this. This card's whatever. I'm sure it's playable, but it's nothing amazing. It's the blue half. Okay, same thing. Makes, an o makes a creature an O2. Draw two. XL five permanents for each permanent XL with control is four four. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not a very big fan of this one. This one, you can, like, turn your lands into 4-4s, four I guess. So you could get, like, turn, like, four of your lands into 4-4s four and get their best blocker out of the way and start trading your lands for their... I don't know, whatever. Seems fine. I don't like putting too much thought into the Mythic Planeswalkers because it's just, like, such a very minimal part of the format. Like, you can literally play, like, 100 drafts and see them play once, you know? Selfless Glyph Weaver. It's a 2-3 that can sack to protect the team. That seems fine. And this one, holy crap, 8 mana for... You choose one thing and kill everything else. Okay, so this is obviously like a bomb if you can get to 8. Especially if you're not trying to go super wide. This card just seems fine. Better if you're Silver Quill, obviously. Is another Silver Quill rare? So we have a 1-1 one, one that pumps the team, or the team that came into play this turn, and it can attack. I'm into that. You just always play this, right? And the black half is... This one's a weird one. So you can pump your creatures that aren't too small, or you can deal like one damage to their creature, but you better kill it. Seems like it'd be good with Death Touch, although you wouldn't be, get the 
lord part on your team. So you can... Oh, or, or you can just sack your small creatures for cards, too. Or whenever your larger creatures die that have counters on them, you get cards. But you can just straight up shoot your 1-1 one, one to draw a card. This card's very versatile, very interesting, the way that that ability works. I'm into that. They both seem pretty good, right? Both halves of this seem very good. Like, this is definitely better than the other one. The white one's better? Probably. Just being cheap. Like, this lords like every creature you play for the rest of the game, right? Assuming they don't kill it. Torrent Sculptor. Because this war ability doesn't seem like it's found very many cards. Um, so we have a 2-2 that kind of protects itself. When it comes in, you can eat an instant or sorcery to get its mana value. Oh, half of its mana value. So if you eat a 3-drop instant, you get 2 counters. You need to eat a 5-drop to, to make this a 5-5. Five five. So it seems pretty likely you can make this a 4-4 four four or a 3-3. Three three. But it seems kind of difficult to get this to 5. But I guess not, though. Prismari has a lot of really insane top-end stuff. Oh! And you can discard. Right. You can just put this in your yard for two. Okay, that's why this ability is relevant. Right? This You can discard this for two, and then you have a 7-drop to eat. But then this becomes like a 6-6. Six six. I know it's a rare, but like that's the first thing I've seen that's cared about instant or sorcery in the graveyard. And then the other half. Two mana, discard a card, draw a card. If it's an instant or sorcery, you get that damage to creature or planeswalker. Meh. It's okay. I don't like that you like have to discard gas for it to do something relevant. Because usually when you rummage, you want to discard land, right? But if you discard land of this, this does literally nothing but rummage. But I like the creature part. Does it not have flying? It does not have flying. Okay. But it's slightly less good than I thought. I thought it was going to be like a 4-4 flyer for 4 with a good ability. Yeah, so maybe this card is not super awesome just all around because I don't think the back half is very good either. But it's okay. Three for a two-two. You can exile an instant sorcery from your hand and suspend it, basically. You have to cast it, but it costs four less. Okay. So this this is coming down on turn three, ideally, and then you're like suspending the big blue red things. You're suspending this card. So then later you're casting this for four because you it doesn't get rid of colored mana. Right? This can only get rid of colorless. Yeah, four less. Okay. But still, that seems pretty reasonable. Not good though. Just fine. It does something. Four turn or three turns? Three. But still. You have to wait three turns to get your four mana discount. Yeah, I don't know about this one. Doesn't seem powerful enough. Any of your upkeep, exile a card from their library, and you can cast it till end of turn. Can't play lands off of it. Painty color. It's bigger when you do. I like this half better. Because once you have five mana, if you get on tap with it, you might be able to play, like if you land drop, you can play a six drop from them. And this becomes a five five. So like as long as you get on tap with this, you're going to get value, right? I mean, I guess you can't get like you. So you whiff on lands, but. Yeah, so I guess this whiffing on lands make it makes it a lot less good, but. Yeah. I, I mean, if this didn't whiff on lands, like then, yes, it would be much better. But it seems okay though. I'm into it. At least like I play this card. The red half seems better than the blue half for sure. One one menace lifelink. 
If their non-token creatures die, you can pay two to get a pest. And you exile their guy. But you exile their guy no matter what. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a lot of it's a lot of value for a 1-1 one, one for one. But still, it's a 1-1 one, one for one. Without death touch. But it does seem like a good way to build up pests for very little, very little cost. I have a feeling this side's going to be better. Whenever you gain one, you can pay one if you do. Each creature you control. Whoa. Do so you get to lord the team every time you gain life for only one mana? Yeah, that seems pretty bonkers because there are just so many ways to gain life. So many residual and like recurring ways to gain life, right? Yeah. Like both of these sides seem pretty good. Like the black one is just like value, very efficient value card. And then this one is just like win con, right? Go wide win con. Yeah, this one looks pretty good, both of them. Okay, five mana, four, four. Whenever they instant or sorcery, they can pay two. If you if they don't, you get to copy it, okay. So they're like never gonna let you copy it if it's relevant. Um, sometimes it won't be relevant. Like say they just go to slam kill this guy on an empty board. But yeah, this seems totally fine, right? Just taxes their stuff a little bit. Five mana four four. You can't really like it's not it's not a bomb or anything, it's just a solid five mana four four, right? You're like never gonna get this if it's a good effect. It's just gonna tax their stuff. But taxing their stuff is good. Yeah, they need to pay two to kill, exactly. <clears throat> In the back half, each player looks at the top five cards, reveals a land and or instant or sorcery. Puts the cards they reveal this way under their hand and the rest on the bottom in a random order. What? Why? Like, I, why do you play this card? I don't understand the purpose of putting this one in your deck. Am I confused about something? It's just like completely symmetrical and there's no way to like really like break any of the effects. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what this, this must be like a group hug commander card or something. I'm not seeing it. Yeah, I, I don't foresee this one being cast in, uh, in Strixhaven Limited. <laughs> this seems horrible, like it should be a white card. <laughs> so how many... How many cards are there in rare that we haven't looked at yet? Because I don't know if I can power through the entire set. Wait, if I have to do all the rares and all the mythics still? Let's see here. We have... So we did 16 rares here. It's like, how many, like, mono-white rares are there? Um... Seems like a lot of them are MDFCs, huh? Yeah, there's also Mythics. Yeah, let's uh, let's call it a night on the set review. We did all the commons. We did all of the MDFCs. We did all of the uncommons. We did all of the lesson, all of the learn. So I think, and colorless, we did all of the colorless that was not rare or mythic as well. So all that we have left are just the rares and mythics that are not MDFCs. Um, and yeah, I think I will do that tomorrow and then play some games at the end of the stream tomorrow. I appreciate everyone stopping by. I know Florimon is gone, but I appreciated his raid and I would like to give him a shout out if I know how the command works here. Did that work? It did not. Do I need to put it in quotes? Let's see here. This should be, that should, dang, I'm bad, it's a comma. Anyway, you gotta figure it out, that is the guy's name. He is another um, Mythic limited player, always in Mythic at the end of the season, always really high. He was crushing the 17 lands um, best of three leaderboard. Last time I checked, he was in like second or third place. Um, I just put 17 lands on my account, and so I've only got like one event on there, so I can't hit the leaderboard yet. 
but I'm excited to see the data that it's been collecting on uh, on 17 lands. It's a pretty cool program if you ever want to sync your arena with it. Um, I don't know if you've seen the website yet. Go ahead and just go there, show you what the front page of it looks like. But yeah, so you can just click on start tracking and you sync up your account with it and it will track all of your arena activity. And then, you know, if you care about stuff like this, you can also, you know, end up on leaderboards. You can see like people's win rates. Like this person has the highest win rate in Kaldheim Premier Draft at 92%. However, they've only played 23 matches. So if you go to match, the person that's played the most match wins, their win rate is only 63%, but they have much more, right? USS Ghost Boat, thank you for the follow. That's a cool name. USS Ghost Boat, I like that one. Yeah, so Sam Blake, Sam Black has a pretty high win rate and a, a lot of match wins. So like that's more impressive, right, than the person who had the the, the 92 and the 23, right? Because you know that's just that's like three drafts. So you you know you do three seven and seven and ones or whatever. They didn't catch their losing streak yet. They just you know played three and quit. But anyway, it's a it's a very cool website, and you should get on it. If, uh, if you care about competitive limited, they just have so much information. But yeah, this is what you need to do to get started. But yeah, so um, I'm going to do the rest of the cards tomorrow night. At the beginning of my stream at 8, I believe I will do the rares, the remaining rares that I have not covered. Um, yeah, it'll just be the monocolor rares and then the, the two color rares in the guilds. I don't know how many total cards that is, probably like 70 or 80 cards left. We've done the bulk of it tonight, and it took over four hours to do the commons and uncommons. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with this set. It seems pretty untraditional in terms of the creature combat. Like, I think the, the stat lines on the creatures are just way different than we've seen in a long time. Like, they don't, they don't look as pushed in terms of creatures. Whereas the spells are doing a lot more things than maybe they normally do. Coming out of the sideboard and all that. Yeah, I appreciate you being here. And I will see you next time. Much love.